You know, let's just pretend I didn't spend a year of my life on this video. <laughs> so, okay, I don't really read many books. I'm not a big reader or anything, but I just kept on getting these TikToks about a man named Brandon Sanderson and how he's like the best author ever with all these, you know, life-changing books. Uh, and um, I wanted to read them. So I read all his books and in this video, we will be ranking them from worst to best. One year of my life. I spent one year of my life. Now I probably read like 10 million words for this video, right? It has to be. Yo, that's actually insane, not gonna lie. So, number 76 is... Starsight. So in Apex Legends, there's a character called Bald Wraith, <laughs> okay? And you know, if you play the game, you know that if you have a Bald Wraith on your team, you just, you just gotta quit. Like, you're just gonna lose. That's just how it is. And that's because a Bald Wraith is indicative of the fact that you're just gonna have such an abhorrently bad experience now, there's no point in even playing, honestly. But Starsight, okay? <laughs> oh, so yeah, Starsight is the second book of the four book Skyward series, which is pretty heavy and hardcover, not gonna lie. And this is uh, Sanderson's YA space opera series, okay? It's about a young girl named Spensa who wants to become uh, the best, I don't know, galactic fighter pilot in Generations. And this might be the worst book I've ever read in Generations, not gonna lie, because this is uh, it's actually hard for me to point out what's bad in this book because everything is so bad. I mean, for the characters, I mean, besides Bald Wraith, they have some weird ones, man. They have like the Power Miners guys in here. They got uh, this, oh, they introduced furries in this one. There were so many times I, I didn't want to read the series that I put this book down and I was, and I just like did chores because it was so horrible. Oh, I'm just laughing because I just I just remember me putting this book down so many times because I didn't want to read it. I'm just gonna move on because like I can't be bothered with this one. Uh, but you know if you abbreviate Bald Wraith, it becomes Brave. Number 75 is Cytonic. I saw a TikTok saying how this is the worst Sanderson book, okay? But in my opinion, even though I feel like that's a pretty popular opinion, this is not as egregious as Starsight, okay? My least favorite book by Brandon Sanderson is Cytonic. Yeah, I did not care about anything that was going on here because while the first book did have, you know, and I say this very loosely, some things going for it in terms of potential, you know, some world and, and characters and story that I was like, okay, I, this could go somewhere interesting. Uh, the second book threw that away, and then whatever crumbs was left, this one threw away. So I think what contributes to such a bad reading experience for people, for this book specifically, is because you go in primed with the knowledge of the first two books, right? Where the second book already did this to you, where you go in with the previous knowledge of the first book, and you expect like some, some sort of relationship between the second and first book, right? Like two diodes, okay? And then, but then you get a completely different story and you're left disappointed. And now when you go into this third book, you think, oh, okay, either book one or two, either Skyward or, or Starsight, right? That they're gonna pick off, uh, you know, maybe you're gonna go with, to some uh, characters like Jorgen uh, or FM or something. Nah. <laughs> no, they said, nah, Brandon said, here, said nah, we, we go into Africa. I was so hopeful, I was like, Maybe Spensa is gonna like solve like some political conflict, or maybe she's gonna uh, go off into battle against like some army or something. Uh, but she she goes nowhere, like like she literally goes nowhere. But the strongest parts of Skyward, okay, were like the characters and the narrative, where you had Spensa trying her best to prove to everybody that she is like this crazy fighter fighter pilot, and that she has like you know the capacity to kill the to kill these aliens in a in a ship or whatever, right? Because what made Skyward good, right? was that classroom setting where Spensa could, you know, continuously prove to everybody uh, in, in these, like, uh, moments of glory that she is, in fact, the greatest fighter pilot that humanity has against these aliens. Um, and then you just get this, which is, like, some weird solo exploration uh, book, which is just really disappointing because th this just has nothing to do with anything, to be honest. This book is so disconnected that even Sanderson just took Bald Wraith, introduced her in book two, and then left her in book two. And instead he, he brought back Steve Irwin. Like, I'll make it make sense. Number 74 is Defiant. This is a pretty recent book, you know. This only came out under under a year ago, maybe like 10 months ago or something. Uh, and are you guys noticing a trend of uh, what type of books are at the bottom here? You know, what specific series is at the bottom here? Oh, look, let me bring it back, okay? Uh, Bald Wraith makes their dramatic return here in uh, one of the tetralogy finales of all time called Defiant. This is the fourth and final book of the Skyward Tetralogy. And honestly, I'll, I'll say one good thing about this book is that since it's one of the more recent ones that Sanderson has put out, you know, he's been writing for a long time and this one like only came out last November. So uh, 
humor's pretty good. I'll, I'll admit, like, there are some moments with the, uh, the furries from book two, they come back here. You know, they have some good jokes. I'm gonna I'm admit, you know, he might be, he might be Dave Chappelle. I actually do remember the one line uh, that made me laugh. And it's, uh, when this dead character comes back and then he says, boo, I'm a ghost. <laughs> That's so, st but they did basically just retcon the entire series with this one book. Uh, I just found out what that word meant two weeks ago, but uh, honestly, yeah, the Saitoverse needs to stop. I'm glad Brandon is uh, stepping away from that. I think that was one of his big announcements at uh, his convention called uh, Dragonsteel Nexus last year is that he wants to step away from this and let uh, another woman named uh, Jancy Patterson take over instead, because there unfortunately will be more Skyward books. But yeah, no, honestly, thank Adelnasium that Brandon stepped down because I was using like, I was losing like 50 breath every time I had to read a Skyward book. You know, you know, 50 BEU lost. You know, I'm like a decade clean of being a League of Legends player. And every single one of these books felt like picking up that mouse and keyboard again and putting my, putting my, uh, my fingers on QWER, you know, because it, it really brought out the worst of me. I'm not going to lie. Number 73 is Long Chills in Case Doe. Now, if you're going to knock me, oh, actually, first let's, let, Let's all clap it up for, for the fact that we don't have to talk about the Skyward series anymore. We actually will be talking about it later. But listen, alright. If you want to knock me for not enjoying any one of these Sanderson stories, it can be this one, okay? I, I'm, I'm fine with it being this one because I genuinely did not have the reading comprehension, like, to understand this book. Uh, I, I understand it now, actually, because I read I read up on it in, like, the wiki and, like, uh, on Reddit and stuff. Long Chills in Case, though, is a Sanderson curiosity. That means that it's a story that he wrote a long time ago, but it was never published, and now he's releasing it to fans as just like bonus content, you know? So you can read this story for free on his website, or you can just buy a hardcover, although I don't know why you wouldn't want a hardcover of this one. Because really, this is just a project he did for university that it's like, it's like cool to see where he came from and where he is now, so you can like compare it, you know, if you're a big fan of his. Uh, like I am, look, look I, I hate Skyward, but I'm a fan, okay, I'm a fan. So why this is so far down the list for me is because it's like, it's a noir detective story, where the character in it just uses the most confusing, old-timey detective nomenclature, okay? He speaks all- he doesn't, he doesn't even use words like is, the, or of, okay? He just speaks with, with words like, like, gumshoe. I've never even heard someone use that word except in Phoenix Wright, and that's, like, kind of ironic, so... Genuinely, every chapter, okay, every chapter until the story was done made no sense to me. It made absolutely no sense. And I was trying so hard to follow along, like really trying so hard, but my attention span is not that good. And I was thinking, I was sitting there like, okay, so he's a detective, right? But then there's like these endoskeleton mind scans, but then it's also like old timey, like noir. So it's like kind of 1980s. Like I, I was like, what's going on? What I didn't get until I was done was that the joke is that he, it's a noir detective story, but the guy lives in like a, like a sci-fi high tech world. So he lives in like a very modern world, but He's just a weirdo who uses these big old school detective words to, to throw you off. I mean, I guess, like it was just so confusing. I've genuinely never seen the word gumshoe used unironically before, except in Phoenix Wright, so I, I don't know. Number 72 is I Hate Dragons. I know, one of the most famous Sanderson stories of all time. That's a joke because it genuinely, I don't think anybody knows this exists. So this is another weird one where I Hate Dragons is a writing exercise that like where Sanderson was just writing for practice, right? So it's, it's, it's like, it's inherently garbage. So it's like a short story that's extended from a writing exercise that he did in 2011. So it, it's just inherently bad because there's like three chapters, right? But it goes one, two, and four. So there's like a third chapter that doesn't exist that he didn't want to release where he introduces like the Minecraft witch, but it's so bad that he couldn't even put it out. So he just released the story in like chapter one, two, and four. So yeah, that's, that's why this is number 72. It's by definition incomplete and unpolished. Like it, it's, it barely functions as a story. <laughs> this, this is like the stuff you find if you leak my notes app. Like, I don't know if I'm, I'm conveying to you guys just how like janky this thing is. Cause the first chapter is just only dialogue. Like there's there's no like descriptive language. It's, it's genuinely just running dialogue between two characters as, as writing practice. And then from there on, it becomes, he, or he tries to salvage it. I don't even know what else to say. There's these two dragon hunters talking, right? And then they, they just keep going back and forth. And then like, apparently it's on like a cube world. So this is like the live action Minecraft movie. It, it Every piece of dialogue uh, is supposed to like change the story and make it into something else. 
um, to show that, like, I guess, like, every line in a story can be impactful and, and, and be, a, uh, you know, and, and, um, yeah, I don't even know. I give up. I give up. Number 71 is Stephen Leaves. Stephen, Stephen Leaves. <laughs> Yeah, he, Steven, Steven should leave, honestly. Now, number 71 is Steven Leeds' Death and Faxes, okay? Uh, Steven Leeds' Death and Faxes is the fourth entry in the Legion series. Kinda. I, it's, it's weird because there's this book right here. It's called, uh, Legion, The Many Lives of Steven Leeds, right? Uh, and there's three stories in here. Three Legion stories that have been compiled into this from 2012, 2014, and 2018. But, uh, Steven Leeds' Death and Faxes is actually not even in this one. It's not even- it, it's part of the trilogy, but kinda, because it's episodic. So it's an audio exclusive from 2022. The finale to the Legion series in this book is from 2018. Basically in 2022 he went back and he made a, another Legion story, uh, this time about a fax machine. Legion is about this celebrity crime solver named Stephen Leeds. He is this guy with like these imaginary friends, but each imaginary friend is a genius in their own field. So he'll come across um, like a math equation that's like very complex, uh, and then he'll just ask his his homeboy in his head, who's like a math genius, how to solve it. Or he'll uh, come across somebody speaking French, and he doesn't he doesn't know French, but he has an imaginary friend who does know French, and so he'll he'll ask his imaginary friend for like Google Translate, you know. So kind of like the gimmick is that these imaginary friends are called aspects, right? And so he asks these aspects for help asks these aspects and so to everybody else he looks insane but to him he's just a perfectly normal guy with, with some friends it's just that nobody else can really see his friends while i do think it's pretty cool that like he's just talking with his talented inner demons to solve international crimes there are there are a few problems i have with this book uh one is again kind of comprehension because uh as an audible exclusive especially i can't see the spelling of any of these words even in long chills in case though i could at least see the the word on the page not like I understood what it meant, but I could at least see it on the page. This one, they got words like Enoch, Manichaeism, Davood. Bro, I don't, I don't know what's going on. So there's that and there's like all these extra things that, that drag the book down for me. Like there's these weird religious inserts that, you know, not, nothing wrong with a religion in, religious inserts, I guess. Because there's this big plotline of this Iranian hacker who's committing tax fraud on Iranian Americans, okay? They just they just have to track him down, which is already like a very complex situation, but then like and the weird thing is that the story just periodically stops because the aspects, right? The imaginary friends just sit down and they have a debate about religion every once in a while. And so when you're constantly like stopping the story to just have like a religious debate, I don't think that's very subtle and it it, it kind of ruins the flow, not gonna lie. But also, ain't no way Sanderson wrote wrote this book. There's like three authors on the front of that cover, okay? And you can kind of tell when Sanderson does a collab with other authors that it just doesn't read like him. But yeah, tough listen. It was just, it was just weird, you know? The whole uh, Jubilee middle ground in the white room and then the whole uh, fax machine causing cancer to like Iranian... Uh, it was weird. I'm, I'm be honest, it was weird. Number 70 is Heuristic Algorithm and Reasoning Response Engine. Can't believe I said that all. I'm, I'm starting to realize that a lot of these ones that I rank lower is because there's just a lot of big words and they, they're confusing, you know? Meh. So confusing. But this is a short story written uh, in collaboration with his good friend and they called uh, Ethan Skarstead. Okay, it's in between Ethan Skarstead and Brandon Sanderson. Uh, you may know, if you're watching this, if you know anything about uh, Stormlight, Ethan Skarstead, Scar from Bridge 4, will get there eventually. I didn't even understand this. Like, I don't even dislike the general premise of the story about how this, like, military task force is, is coming here. To this random planet where there's a, a mecha insect outbreak like that's basically solo leveling you know the best way i can put it is like when i read long chills in case though that felt like reading a story in a language that i didn't understand okay but this just felt like reading an oxford dictionary it was just word after word after word it's just filled to the brim with military buzzwords like you know like bullet and gun <laughs> number 69 is a fire within the ways now this one's kind of interesting right because uh brandon sanderson uh you guys should know that he was the one who was called in to uh, finish Robert Jordan's legendary The Wheel of Time series. It's uh, these books right here. It, there's 14 books. This is book 13 right here, Towers of Midnight. And this is book 14, the last one, A Memory of Light. These are long books. I had to read all 14 of these books for this video. These are long, man. It's like 5 million words. And these are packed. Like, these are, these are packed to the brim with words. Let me show you the hardcover, because I actually... Look how big this is. 
genuinely look how big this is. This is a first edition copy of the Gathering Storm that I found at a, uh, at like a farmer's market. This is how big it should be, okay? It's just massively packed into the, this, this tiny book. A Fire Within the Ways is a portion of the 14th and final book, A Memory of Light, that didn't make the final cut. It was cut out of the book. This is 10 chapters of nothing. Really nothing, nothing happened <laughs> uh, in, the, in these 10 chapters. That's why it was cut out, because it was boring. Didn't really make any sense to put it in here, okay? You know, it is kind of reflective of the Wheel of Time as a whole, though, because I read all 10 chapters, and I was like, wow. All those words, all that time spent, for just like a crumb or two of enlightenment and, and listen okay I, look i read the wheel of time okay i read i read the entire thing uh it, it's a horrible series and it's my favorite of all time okay i'm a victim of stockholm syndrome like the character that's about we i think we've, we've had enough of them okay there's already like 10 million plot lines in these books like we don't we don't need more of this dude you know what surprised me though was when i went online and i didn't see a single negative comment about a fire within the ways but then i realized that it's probably selection bias okay because if anybody knows about A Fire Within the Ways, then they've had to read 5 million words of The Wheel of Time. They've had to read books 1 through 14 all the way through. So anybody who's like writing reviews of A Fire Within the Ways is already probably a big fan of the series, like a diehard fan. Wait, yeah, like anybody who's go like going out of their way to read a deleted excerpt of a 14th book in one of the craziest, longest fantasy series of all time like, you're just too far gone. Like, you're you're, it, it's, <laughs> you're done. Number 68 is Snapshot. I swear a lot of these, like, lesser-known Sanderson books are just really dark for some reason. Not like that's bad or anything, actually, because, you know, I like... The Poppy War. I, it was just jarring, and I left this book wondering, like, what the reason for it was. Because this book is a detective story about these two guys who are investigating a crime, right? And so in this world, uh, it's like a, a sci-fi world where technology has, uh, you know, improved. And so the police... Um, in their investigation techniques use this something called a snapshot to investigate crimes where they basically create like a VR uh, world let, let, let me let me explain that again actually let me let me let me let me lock in so the police right to investigate any crime they can just create a virtual world for any moment in time I give up so they, they call, the concept is cool though right you know kind of it sounds cool it's better it, if you read it, it it works pretty well the thing is that like the book reads in a way where it's showing off this cool premise and and not much else honestly but like showing off a cool premise is already better than skyward but this is like when someone's acting like overly funny and, and quirky and, and you're just looking at them like why are you doing this man like this ain't you be yourself i don't know how to else to put it except to just give you ex examples of like this this quirkiness right so the main character he has a he has a thing for coins not like not like in a weird way but he just likes collecting old coins and then like he, he talks about like eating them and stuff and then like bringing them out of the because they're, they're virtual coins but then you, you can maybe bring them out of the virtual world and into into reality i guess and then the main character's partner is, is just a straight up terrible guy like like you he you, you're introduced to him and he just like kills off his, his co-workers but like the virtual co-workers like he, he just likes terrorizing his friends virtually wait is that what i do but basically right you have this guy who's obsessed with coins and then this guy who likes dehumanizing his friends and and just makes for a really weird story especially with the with the turns that that this takes honestly at this point like I, i'm just so burnt out of detective stories like like not just because of all the stuff on snakebird plus i'm talking like there's so many sanderson de detective stories number 67 is perfect state now this is actually very similar to snapshot but uh, a lot a lot better honestly yo the synopsis for this story got me so hyped it, it got me like the most hyped for a sanderson story in a while because i've just been reading these sanderson stories like back to back to back but it's basically like if they pitch it like oh what if the most powerful man in the world meets the most powerful woman of her world and then they have to go on a date like that's so sick bro i thought it was gonna be like love is war where the, the main theme is power and then they have, they have to kind of have to like you know contest on who has the most power in, in a more like intimate setting uh, it was not like that at all it was pretty bad honestly it wasn't even bad it was just disappointing like the turns that this took it was like wreck it ralph 2. it was genuinely like what is going on the villain in this is one of the most pathetic sorry villains i just don't even know what else to say without spoiling because it's just so sad and what's that person name again melly oh my y and w melly yeah this 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 person who's the villain y and w melly yo this this story generally doesn't even need a villain like it, it's already good enough just as the romance i i don't even understand why this person exists number 66 is hyper thief so every year every december uh brandon's been hosting this convention in utah which is where he's from 
called uh, Dragon Steel. Now it's been actually renamed to Dragon Steel Nexus. But last year at Dragon Steel Nexus, there was this um, convention-wide game where you could piece together a story on the backs of origami ships that was just just for the convention. Although now you can get it as an as a free ebook. But that's Hyper Thief. It's this. Uh, it was ba it was a convention-wide game exclusive that's now available for free. That's a really short story in the Cytoverse. And if I didn't explain what the Cytoverse is, it's this. It's the, the the Skyward universe. So we're back to talking about Skyward. And so Hyper Thief is about a birthday party. Because there's a character in this Skyward universe who is having a birthday party, but then there was a thief going around trying to ruin the birthday. And so that's the story. Number 65 is Mitosis. And this has got to be like the biggest filler episode of all time. Uh, so I've been talking to you guys about the Cytoverse, the Skyward series, uh, which is his, Brandon's YA series. You know, young adult kind of... Uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call these types of stories? Coming of age, right? Well, he has another YA series that is much less popular. I don't know why. I like it a lot better. Actually, not a lot, but I, I do like it better. It's called The Reckoners. Yeah, this is actually my own personal copy. I got most of these I got from the library. You kind of see the library tag on there. But um, this is my own personal copy of Steelheart, the first book in the Reckoners series, which is not what we're talking about. But we're talking about Mitosis, which is the book so scuffed yeah mitosis is reckoners 1.5 is what i'm trying to say so it comes right after this uh and see firefights here i cannot for the le for the life of me get a copy of firefight for this video but the reckoner series is about people who randomly get superpowers uh but everybody who gets super superpowers did i say super fires everybody who gets superpowers in the reckoner series uses them for evil so it's like the boys i i know i hate i hate to make the comparison but I mean, look, it, the Reckoner series ca came out in uh, 2013. Brandon wasn't copying anybody. It just happens that that kind of trope of evil superheroes is pretty popular these days. Anyways, as this is like 1.5, it is like this weird short story that is between books one and two. It's about this really minor villain called Mitosis, whose power is, can, can you guess? He can make shadow clones of himself basically right it's a, just a very unimportant story maybe not as unimportant as like the birthday party <laughs> a lot of the conclusions that david who's the protagonist of the reckoners comes to in mitosis he already came to those conclusions at, at the end of this one at the end of steelheart it, it's just very redundant i don't know which is kind of kind of funny because it's like mitosis so it's like like there's multiple of the same thing so it's like the same thing over and over again which is yeah number 64 is Mistborn, Shadows of Self. Hey, pretty pretty cool, huh? I own both of these copies, actually, because I, I had this one, I, I read it, I read uh, with this copy, but then I was like, at a used bookstore, the same one where I got uh, that Steelheart copy, and I found the hardcover. I think this is a first edition, too. So, Mistborn, Shadows of Self over here. This is this is a pretty big book. We're, we're off the short stories now and, and into some, some of the more real you know, books that people like. I'm pretty sure this is the first Cosmere book of the video, right? Because um, Brandon's known for the Cosmere, his kind of connected universe, where a lot of these books uh, are kind of like intertwined and they kind of like connect to one another in these like cool ways that you'll only know if you've read all his books. Basically, it's what made me interested in reading all his books in the first place, the, the idea of the Cosmere, the idea that all of these books kind of uh, interlink with one another at cool moments, right? This is the fifth mainline uh, book in the Mistborn series, one of his most popular series. I think second only to like Stormlight, but uh, earlier than Stormlight, like it, you know? See that, why see? You know, let's just say that the Mistborn series is one of his two most defining series as an author, okay? And this is the uh, fifth mainline one, making it book two of Mistborn Era 2, as the, the first three books are part of Mistborn Era 1, and then there's four books in Mistborn Era 2. And this is the second of those four books in Mistborn Era 2. Mistborn Era 1 is legendary. Those three books are so good and they're back to back to back that when you get into Mistborn Era 2, it's like um, kind of a harsh r uh, reset kind of on the series. And so it's just really hard to follow up something that good. And so you read this book with the preconceived expectations that it'll be as good or better than Mistborn Era 1, which it really isn't for a lot of people. And look, I enjoyed Era 2, but this is a really weak book. I must say, like, the plot lines of Era 1 were so dense and so intricate, and this you're just chasing a monster. So this is like a monster hunting book. Everything just feels very bland. 
uh, in comparison to the the original trilogy so yeah that's why it's here number 63 is warbreaker okay i'm already preparing myself because like look this uh, this is controversial okay look if you're watching this and you're disappointed i am also disappointed okay i, I brought this to the club I just heard lots of praise for this book as one of Sanderson's best, and I just felt really let down when I read it. But let's break it down, okay? So, in this book, there are two kingdoms. And so you have the City of Gods as one kingdom, who is ruled by, like, this guy named the God King. Okay, this, like, larger-than-life, uh, ethereal type of ultra-powerful dude. And then there's another kingdom, which is just a regular kingdom, and that regular kingdom has a king with two daughters, okay? And so, when he had his first daughter, his oldest daughter, the king kind of um, raised her to marry her off to the god king. And so when she was of age, and when it was time for him to marry this daughter off to the god king, he was like, wait, she's too good for him though. You know, so, she, so he was like, wait, I can't, I can't be giving her away like that, you know? I've raised her too well. So instead, he sends off the youngest daughter who, is, she just spent her life like frolicking in the woods and stuff. And so kind of the premise of this book is you have these two daughters, right? who kind of have to like switch lives and then uh, kind of deal with their lives now that they've kind of switched over where you have the youngest daughter who has lived her life very freely what, doing whatever she wants and now she finds herself married off to this this guy named the God King who she knows nothing about and she has to travel all this way to this to this uh, city of the gods and you have the older sister who's been raised for this same purpose but has now find her life opened up to her and she doesn't know what's, how to deal with all that freedom. And so I hope that was a good explanation. Uh, hopefully it sounds interesting because it was interesting to me when I first um, heard of this book. But when I actually got into reading it, I realized that it, um, a lot of the characters are, are very blind, which I didn't like. I, as a reader, am blind to the story until I get there, right? But a lot of the characters felt blind too, like uh, the two sisters are named uh, Viviana and Siri, and they're, they'd have no clue what they're doing. Like their lives have been completely turned around. They don't know what they're doing. And so I also, as the reader, do not know what's going on because they don't know what they're doing, if that makes sense. So this reads as like a mystery novel, kind of, right? Because you don't know what's going on. There's like all this mystery, like what is the city of the gods? Who is this god king? What are these two girls supposed to do? And so out of these characters, I told you about the two sisters, but there's four POV characters, point of view characters that this story kind of alternates through, right? There's the two sisters, Viviana and Siri. Then there's this guy named Lightsong. I don't even know if I want to talk about that guy in this video. That's a whole other problem. And then there's Vasher, which that's like a spoiler, so I can't even talk about that. But what I'm trying to say is that Viviana is the best character in this book. Why she's not, why this book is not last is because Viviana's POV is, is so good. You know what? You know what? I'll, I'll talk about Light Song, okay? Easily the, the worst of the four POVs. This, this man, like, reading his parts in this book was actually such a lifeless experience. Pun not intended, but intended. You know, yeah, sorry, I had to get a little tongue-in-cheek, you know. Number 62 is... Skyward. Okay, we're finally here. Let me actually lock in for this, alright? Oh, I never even see, saw this. Look, on the back it says, Defiance is... Can't even read it, but it says, Defiance is Survival on there. I just noticed that. It's also nice. Honestly, I'll be honest, this is a nice cover, okay? Skyward is the first of four books in the Tetralogy of the same name, about a girl named Spencer who wants to become the greatest fighter pilot in humanity's history, but nobody lets her fly a plane. And that's what annoys me about this series. Spensa is just so good at killing aliens in this in this uh, fighter plane jet thing, okay? She's just simply the best fighter pilot ever that humanity has, and nobody wants to let her fly ever. Like literally everything that goes wrong in Spensa's life goes wrong and it really feels heavy-handed by the author like some of it i'm like i'm reading this i'm like this is this is not realistic like it, this is very forced some of these developments here for spensa where genuinely everything goes wrong everything is against her the whole this woman right here the whole world is against this woman and so she has no choice but to claim the stars it's just such an infuriating read that every single person tries their best to demean her disrespect her and then she even has a bad response to those people trying to do that. And where she's just like, no, peace and love, guys, peace and love. I'm a very character-centric guy, okay? And I just really hated the characters here. I really hated Spence. I really hated Jorgen. really hated Mbot. really hated Cobb. Uh, Ironsides is okay. You know, that's just my opinion. But, you know, maybe I just feel too old for this, which is a crazy thing to say. Because I read Alcatraz, did not feel too old for that. This is, like, Brandon Sanderson's crowning YA series, young adult series. 
but man, it, it I just feel like I'm too mature for this. The specific combination which makes the Skyward series bad is just, you know, this heavy-handed plot direction with these insufferable characters with just the weirdest developments and the weirdest, like, like the furries and everything. It's like, I, I, I just can't. I'm sorry. This is this, this comes off so poorly to me. But you know what? This first book could have been a lot worse. After reading the later entries in the series, could have been a lot worse. It's okay. It's mid. Number 61 is Alcatraz versus the Knights of Crystallia. There we go. I can't believe I got my hands on this book because this is the um, the really old cover of these series uh, that I found at my library. Here's the, the original one if you guys want to see that. He looks like Harry Potter because this is made during the time where Harry Potter was big, I think. I think it's like Brandon had a four book deal with Scholastic and then after the four books, he wanted to make uh, two more books. He just wanted to write more Alcatraz but uh, they didn't want more Alcatraz, so he just bought back the books because, I don't know, maybe they weren't selling well or something. And he also changed the covers, which is what I'm trying to say. New covers are just a lot better. Like, they're really nice. You should see the, uh, maybe I'll put them on screen, the, the new covers of this series. The Alcatraz vs. the Evil Librarian series is a kid's book series about this goofy little boy uh, named Alcatraz, who I didn't imagine him looking like Harry Potter, but I guess he, he looks like Harry Potter here. And so this is the third Alcatraz book, Alcatraz vs. the Knights of Crystallia, and I think it's the worst one, and it's mainly due to setting. Because since these are kids' books, you can kind of immediately tell what this is about if the camera will focus. Uh, but in this book, Alcatraz goes to just a very, very stereotypical uh, magic kingdom, not the one in Florida. And then there are these knights who have crystal powers, and then they fight. And so he's in this kingdom with knights and evil librarians and he has to fight them. See, it even sounds boring. So just off setting, like this is, like I thought just pretty lifeless as an Alcatraz book because the novelty of the trademark Alcatraz humor has like worn off by the third book. Oh, and I just realized the back has the dragon because in this book, there are dragon cars. Instead of Uber, they have like these dragons without wings. Is that? Oh, and his face is on the front. Look, he's right here. But um, there's a lot of out of place jokes here, okay? Like um, there's, there's jokes about like, how Alcatraz and his friends are compared to like the Brady Bunch and like the UCLA Honors Department. Like what kind of kid would understand that reference? Oh, and, and last thing I'll note is that even though I have the physical version here, I did not read a single Alcatraz book like like physical. I read them all or, uh, or I listened to them all through graphic audio, a movie in your mind, you know? So the voice actor for Shasta killed she killed, she ate in this. I'm a big fan of graphic audio, so I just wanted to say that. Number 60 is the 11th medal. And so I have this little thing here that I'll bring out. It's called Brandon Sanderson's Arcanum Unbounded, the Cosmere Collection, okay? Now this book right here uh, has a bunch of short stories that are all Cosmere short stories. Apparently there's gonna be a version of this, which is like um, a collection of all the, the short stories that I've, I've kind of talked about already. I didn't like any of them that are non Cosmere related, like Snapshot, Perfect State. Apparently, it was just like a little bonus thing where Hyper Thief was a, was a Dragon Steel bonus. This was like a Mistborn RPG role playing game bonus. It was, it was a bonus made for that game where you get kind of the backstory of Kelsier. Kinda, not really. It's not really the backstory. You just get a kind of a scene in his backstory where he works with this old dude to steal more things because he's a thief. And the 11th medal is basically a Kelsier fan fiction. It's a Mistborn Cosmia short story, right? And uh, honestly, I think I just spoiled the entire book because it's, it's very short. Like, uh, where is it here? Let me, let me, let me, check. yeah, it's like 20 pages or so. Honestly, it's whatever. I mean, I, it doesn't really impact anything, but I, I guess this part of the, the video is, is kind of those stories that really don't have that much impact. I mean, it's cool. Number 59 is Sunreach. Now, this is part of the Skyward Flight Collection, <laughs> so I guess we're talking about Skyward again. But um, I really tried to get the Skyward Collection in person, but I didn't, I didn't want to buy it, I'm gonna be honest. So the Skyward Flight Collection is a collection of three short stories written by Jancy Patterson, co-authored by Brandon Sanderson, for the Cytoverse, the Skyward Universe, and it lands in between the third book, uh, Cytonic, and the fourth book, Defiant, in the, in the uh, Tetralogy, okay? So Sunreach is the first of these three short stories, and honestly, it's okay. I had pretty low expectations of this in the, in the first place because I had to go through Skyward, Starsight, and Cytonic. But honestly, Jancy kind of ate here. Sunreach focuses on 
another girl in Spence's class who at this moment in the series is tasked with figuring out the science behind some of how these supernatural creatures get their powers. If this is any indication of what the Cytoverse will be like now that Sanderson has kind of left uh, and now Jancy's in charge and she's like the leader of the whole project. She's the one writing Blightfall, which is going to come out next year. Honestly, good. This is a good direction for the Cytoverse, I think, because yeah, I, I like these short stories. I like the direction. I, it feels a lot better, you know? And yeah, we're at that point in the video where all these stories in this kind of section are, are just all right. And yeah, you know, plot was all right. World was all right. Characters were all right. Jancy, good job. I, I will say, though, that like by this point in my Sanderson reading career, it was so hard to get through these books. It was really, really hard. I think I read this one like um, on my phone on like on like the Kindle app or something. Yeah, number 58 is Dreamer. Now this is another very short little passage that Sanderson wrote. It's very underground actually. I don't think a lot of people know about this, uh, but it's really just one big action sequence that he wrote. And I'm just surprised like how easily accessible this was actually for me to read because I thought I'd have to go out and buy like a $3 like ebook or something. But no, my library had this, uh, Thing called the games creatures play anthology which is where this sits and i could just easily read it for free so yeah this is just a very fast action sequence of these five ghost cops chasing one ghost criminal another detective story another ghost story any snake bird plus fan <laughs> just a cool fast read the, the gimmick is that everybody can switch bodies because everybody's a ghost uh but anything other than that is a spoiler so yeah cool number 57 is legion skin deep steven leeds is just batman he's like a he's like a mentally troubled batman so batman but yeah legion skin deep second of the three main legion stories and the worst one in my opinion even though i think it's technically like the most uh drawn out even though actually drawn out has a bad connotation doesn't it more it's the most fleshed out legion story i think it takes up most of this of these pages that being said it is less cool less satisfying and less brilliant than the original legion here we get more kind of showcasing of steven's powers how he can use this uh like superhuman ability of being able to talk to imaginary genius friends to solve crimes uh you have the introduction to the white room very classroom of the elite coded i must say and we also get one of like the coolest moments in the whole legion series in this specific story where he kind of has to outsmart this assassin in this really cool, but also very logical way. But even though we get like so much more information about Steven and how he uses his powers and uh, this whole um, kind of kind of world, even though it's basically just our world, the characters are worse, the plot is worse, and everything it kind of just takes a, a downturn here. But wait, I actually didn't even tell you what this is about. This is about, um, <laughs> it's called Skin Deep because he's investigating, or the, the mission that he has to investigate this time is that there's a guy who made artificial cancer. And so there's the threat of cancer being spread to all the humans of the world. Yeah, just straight up a lot less cool than the premise of the original Legion, which um, if you don't know is there's a time traveling camera. <laughs> so with this and Death and Faxes, you have two stories now about uh, cancer causing technology. This one about kind of this epidemiology Nikon. And you have the other one about the cancer-causing fax machine. So, yeah, I don't know, like, why, why are half of the Stephen Leeds stories about cancer-causing technology? I just want to know. Number 56 is Bastille versus the Evil Librarians. So not Al Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarians, but Bastille versus the Evil Librarians. Now, this is the sixth kind of book in the Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarian series. It takes place after the first five Alcatraz books, and it features um, the character of Bastille. And she is now, instead of a side character, a POV character. So you get a Alcatraz book from the POV of Bastille. Bastille is a knight with crystal powers. If you remember, uh, knight, there's a book called Alcatraz versus the Knights of Crystallia. Uh, she is an, a knight of Crystallia, maybe even the knight of Crystallia. Uh, and honestly, I don't remember much from this book. I really should have gotten the physical. Uh, I actually don't remember anything, so I'm pulling up my notes here. And, and, I, and I read, um, or I wrote down, I don't know why, why I wrote this, but I said, uh, this feels like reading Stormlight 10 early, but for infants, and it doesn't leave, live up to the hype. You know, I guess I meant that there's just so many action sequences in this book. Like, in comparison to normal Alcatraz books, there's usually scenes where he's like in, in prison, or maybe he's like monologuing to himself. No, this is like a straight up like action book. But this is this high up because it is a pretty dense and content heavy book. It's just that I didn't retain all of that information. Like I probably read this and I was like, oh, this is really good. 
Bastille, yay, POV. But honestly, the POV changed to Bastille. Like, um, the gimmick died pretty, pretty uh, fast. You know, by this point, after I've read five books from Alcatraz's POV, I was just like, wait, I kind of prefer Alcatraz narrating than Bastille. So can we have like another Alcatraz book? But still like, <laughs> Bastille, <laughs> but still like uh, the main themes of the book, which are kind of like, you know, courage, um, I just remember courage, actually, what were they? Yeah, courage, imperfection, forgiveness, yeah, yeah, all, 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 the, all the stuff, you know, the virtues, it was okay. Number 55 is River of Souls. A Fire Within the, Within the Ways was a whole segment that was cut out from this book, a whole character arc. River of Souls is one chapter, but between the two, I think this one's the more canon one. And I say more because really they're both cutscenes, so none of them are canon, but this is like relatively more canon-ish because this focuses on one character, which um, kind of spawned in, let's say, very late in the series to a point where it's like, why is this character being added in now? It's a character that would have made sense to be added in like in the middle of the series, maybe like book eight out of 14. Either way, there's a character who just becomes really important very fast. And so this one chapter is very important because it's their backstory. And so it kind of eases you in. So their appearance isn't as abrupt really. But overall, like even though this is a good chapter, that I think deserves to be, you know, higher up on this list than something like, like Starsight. Its absence in the story, I, I think is okay, honestly. Only because, like, when you, when you get to this point, when you get to book 14 of the Wheel of Time, there are way more important things that the words need to be used on than, like, a, a guy's random appearance. Like, there are so many plot lines that need to be concluded that, uh, you know, a chapter like this that doesn't have that much impact, honestly, it, it can be cut, it's fine. Number 54 is Children of the Nameless. Now that we've sifted through the stories that I thought were bad or that I didn't understand, I think we're in the ones that are, that are like, good, but, but a bit weird. Children of the Nameless is a story that Sanderson wrote for Magic the Gathering, which is the card game, like, the most famous trading card game of all time. Actually, it's probably Pokemon, but I have a, a very high high degree of expertise with trading card games, okay? I was a big trading card game growing up. Uh, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Kaijudo, uh, Buddy Fight. I'm a big Buddy Fight guy, okay? That being said, the one that I never really got into was Magic the Gathering, which is like the main one. So that affects how I perceive the story. It could be a lot higher if I actually knew about it. This book actually reminds me of one called um, One Dark Window. There's a lot of just like the same tropes, like the voice talking in the head, you know, the, the heavy air of mystery with everything, mother nature being a very important part, right? Trees. But that one comparison that nobody asked for is actually like the only commentary I really have for this because I just did not get any of the references. Like, I, I got was, what was going on, the, the planeswalkers and stuff like that. I'm just not part of the community. I just don't really, really understand it like that. So I get what was going on, but it wasn't as cool to me as if I, like, I were a fan. And I feel like this was made by a fan for fans. It's still a good story. I enjoyed it. It was cool. It's also, like, pretty, pretty lengthy. Isn't it, like, 40,000 words or something? Number 53 is Centrifugal. I really enjoyed this. I, like... This is, this is so bad, but I enjoyed it so much. Yeah, yeah, this is so bad, it's funny. That's why I enjoyed it. Brandon wrote this in 1994. And so in 1994, okay, this this era populated by uh, by fossils and walking relics, there was this co there, there was this, um, convention called Andromeda One. I think it's what, what it was called, like a sci-fi convention that Brandon went to as a student. And so since this was like, you know, 10 million years ago, Brandon was still very young. And then so he applied to this like sci-fi contest as a student and he won. Uh, like first place and so now that he's like this very established sci-fi fantasy author uh, he now releases this as a Sanderson curiosity as just kind of a bonus like hey look uh, back then I was uh, interested in sci-fi and fantasy and I submitted this piece of work to a contest and the judges there saw some potential in me and so now as a fan I can read this and I can be like oh I see kind of the maybe not the trademarks or hallmarks of his writing but kind of the glimmers of hope. <laughs> uh, I like this one though. Do you guys know what Dyson spheres are? I just saw like a couple videos about them. I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about this, where um, the concept of a Dyson sphere is like, if there was a star or like a celestial body like a star that was like emitting a lot of this energy, and then we could build a device around it, like a, like a huge mega, mega structure around a star and just like harness the energy, like a big mirror or something, right? And so, this is basically a story about a Dyson Sphere, where in a universe where 
I don't know, we technology is advanced to the point that we could build a structure around a star and harness its energy. What happens when things go wrong? I like this a lot, you know? I can see what he means when he says there's a shard of greatness here because um, it was and it was entertaining all the way through, but it, it was it was poorly written. Not like I could write anything better, but there is a shard of greatness here. There is a shard of Adelani Adel number fifty-two. Is white sand. This is another very odd work. White sand is a series of three comic books. Uh, actually, wait, do these connect at the back? No, they don't. They don't. Sorry. White sand is a series of three Cosmere comic books written by Sanderson, and it's unique for that specific reason is that it is a Cosmere comic book. All the other um, stories are prose, right? They're they're just typed up. They're, there's no pictures or anything. I, I do want to put this out there that these are very important for like, if you're if you're like reading the Cosmere, you actually kind of have to read these, which is why now that um, he's done writing Stormlight 5, which, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. He's working on a prose version, a written version, a novel version of these three books. These are just so weird. I'm sorry, my camera blur is really harsh, so I don't know if you can see this, but uh, it's about a boy named Kenton, right? And it's uh, very Dune-esque, so he lives in with like this sand tribe, he's part of the sand tribe, it, but it's actually pretty sick. Since Sanderson is like the magic system guy, uh, how it works and how it's fair is that these sand masters can control sand, but they have to use the, wa the water within their bodies, so the more they control the sand and do cool magical stuff, the more dehydrated that they get, so they have to like kind of limit their usage and carry around water. In this world, right, the plan is split half and half, so one is eternally day and one is eternally night. And s wait, actually, where am I even going with that? I mean, I just wanted to say that, to be honest. I just really like the world. <laughs> really, it's, it's a really cool world with a really cool magic system. I just don't really like the characters or the plot. Kenton is introduced as this character who is the talentless son of the chief of the sand masters right so i thought that the logical conclusion would be that even though he's the talentless son of the chief he would eventually get more powers and then prove everybody wrong uh using maybe creative methods and stuff like that and so i just had the expectation that that's the direction that the series would go where kenton would just amass more and more power and become like more of a paul atreides type of you know ruler of the sand masters type of thing and i was also disappointed because this is this book right here is the introduction of chris chris is you know a player in the cosmere you may find her in some other of brandon's books and this is where she's from she this is like like chris chris is introduced in these books and i don't remember anything from her because it was just boring so number 51 is not this one number 51 is white sand 2 okay slightly better than the first one but honestly same kind of pros and cons i was debating just throwing all the white sands together as one big book because you can get all three of these comic books together in one uh large comic book called the white sand omnibus but they are like three different stories, I guess, and they were released literally as three different books or originally, so I'm, I'm having them as three different entries. And look, I like art a lot, okay, but I want to talk about art mainly for this book. Listen, the art in this one, it's good art. I could not draw any better than this, okay? But it's very, very sketchy, and it makes it really hard to read, not gonna lie. Like, whatever art style they chose from this book, especially with all these, like, particle effects and explosions going on, if you look at this book for too long, like, everything kind of blurs together for me. Maybe it's just I have a problem with stuff like this. This is this is a very hard book to look at, actually, if you, if you sit down and read this, in my opinion, especially with the long with the long blurbs of text, like it's almost Hunter Hunter level, not gonna lie. I don't really have anything else to say about that because it is quite the continuation of the first book. But um, there is a really jarring art style change, I think in, in chapter six. Yeah, it turns into the Archer style. Like, what is this? It just randomly turns into like this weird, um... bro, tell me how are you gonna go from this to this? So like number 50 is White Sand, but the prose version of White Sand found within the Arcanum Unbounded collection. The White Sand that's found within this collection is the current prose version, but it's soon to be outdated once Brandon writes the new one. And it actually only covers, out of the first book, maybe like the first half, not even. I said that the plot let me down in the first White Sand, right? Well, this prose version here only covers up to the point where the plot didn't let me down. So uh, I, I, I tended to like, this over the the first two comic books 
where you get what I think is the best version of White Sand, which is just Renton's introduction. And actually, it's in the prose version, I think, where Renton um, comes across as really likable, where I didn't think he was that likable in the uh, in the comics. Maybe it's because you're really like inside his head, but uh, you really feel for Renton in the prose version. Well, you don't. I didn't really care for him in the. Uh, in those books over there. Reading the prose version was like watching a hype Paul Atreides edit. That's what it was like. And number 49, White Sand 3. The conclusion to the White Sand comic book trilogy. It's my favorite one, but honestly not by a lot. There's just one really good moment here that I'm actually not gonna show you, but I just wanna read it again. <laughs> Big improvement for me is that there's just a totally new art style change here to one that's just more clean. I don't know if you can tell. To me, it's just much easier to read and enjoy it with this art style that's like less clunky, less uh, sketchy with the lines. So even though it's more simple and less stylized, I actually prefer it. And yeah, my favorite moment in the White Sand trilogy is here, and it's from a character that I didn't expect, which is why it hit me so hard when I first read it. Even though most aspects are still improved here, uh, I'd say that overall, not much better than the first three. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to say, shaky foundation, wasted potential. Still enjoyed reading these, but could have been a lot better, not gonna lie. Elephant in the room, I got a haircut. Number 48 is the original, and for something called the original, it's actually not that original. This is also just very much not my thing, so I didn't love it in any, any capacity. But the original is a collab between Brandon Sanderson and fellow author Mary Robinette Kowal. She's an author and puppeteer, of all things. And with most Sanderson collabs, this mostly re reads like a Kowal work, even though I've never really read one, because it just doesn't read like a Sanderson work at all. This is a sci-fi book about a world where there are clones, and so a woman wakes up and is told by the government that she is a clone of another woman who killed her husband, and so the government is trying to give her another chance at life, or maybe I guess technically a first chance at, at life, by going out and trying to kill her original, therefore becoming the original. This feels like something you would read in high school, like Fahrenheit 451, or like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, where it is this dystopian commentary about technology. So this is an audiobook exclusive, so you can find it on Audible. That actually does help with some of the scenes, like a lot of the nightclub scenes where they play music and ambient talking in the background. And once again, this is very much not my thing, but I think Miss Kowal's touch on the story and her writing style is just very watertight, so it's hard not to put this book higher than some of the, the really scuffed ones. All of the typical technology-related themes that, that you would find are in this book. You know, uh, just general technology, government regulation versus free will, uh, distorted perception of the world. And although the themes are the highlight, they also kind of carry the story, because the commentary surrounding all these themes are much more interesting than the characters in the plot. Number 47 is Dawn Shard, and finally this is our first Stormlight-adjacent book. So the Stormlight Archives are Brandon Sanderson's, probably his most popular series, by a Maybe, maybe not a large margin, but at the same time, a large margin. It's his large epic fantasy series, and this is a novella which falls between the third book, Oathbringer, and the fourth book, Rhythm of War. For this novella, it's about an exploration to an unknown island. But what makes it interesting is that it features a certain side character from the mainline books that a lot of people, myself included, were really looking forward to seeing more of because we don't get to see much of them. And also that that character is paired with another side character who was a fan favorite as the most unlikely duo. Think Deadpool and Wolverine, but if Wolverine didn't regenerate his legs and Deadpool didn't regenerate his arm. As much as I really loved the main character here in the mainline Stormlight books, uh, I just thought they were a lot less compelling in their own story. There were definitely crazy moments, but I just didn't love reading this one. Uh, I just read this and I thought, wow. That's cool. Low key though, like the information provided in this is so essential for any Cosme reader that you actually, you, you can't be skipping this, like that's outrageous. Number 46 is Infinity Blade Awakening. Now I'm actually very shocked to see this on this list because in 2011, I played um, the Infinity Blade game, the first one, because now there's three, I didn't even know that. Uh, but I played the first one on my iPad when I was an iPad kid and I was really enamored by the game. I thought it was so sick because it had console-like graphics and that's why it kind of gained popularity as this, um, game that was that could rival console games that you could just play on your phone. Even though Infinity Blade was revolutionary for these graphics, uh, it's a dead franchise now. I think Epic Games bought it and then they just discontinued it. So there are three games and none of them are able to run on like the newest iOS software, but with, between these three games, uh, there are two books which Sanderson wrote. So I'm quite biased towards these books because I actually played the games growing up, unlike Magic the Gathering. But Infinity Blade Awakening follows the story of the first game, where you play as this guy named Cirrus, who is sent to this tower as a sacrifice to appease the God King, not the Halandrin one, but the Infinity Blade one. Uh, and he climbs this tower, defeating monsters, defeating people. Um, and at the end of the game, spoilers for the game, 
he defeats the God King and he takes his sword. And so this book starts off with Cirrus, with the sword, just wondering what to do with his life and what, what to do next. The purpose of these books are to give context to the games, to learn more about the world and to learn more about, um, or maybe not even to learn more about, to, just to give reasoning as to why Cirrus is fighting because the games are just like hack and slash, right? And look, okay, yellow dude with hands up. Th this book is like 90% pretty bad. Like it, until you get to the Sanderlanch, which if you don't know, Sanderlanch is a term that Sanderson fans use to describe Sanderson's endings because they feel like an avalanche to the reader. So, you know, Sanderson, avalanche, Sanderlanch, but the Sanderlanch here is, is incredibly good. That's why it's really up here. And really, like, that's the only good thing here. The Sanderlanch was, was really, really good. Not good enough to keep the games afloat, but still, like, you know, we take those. Number 45 is Evershore. And yes, this is a Skyward novella, the third one in the Skyward Flight collection. And what can I say except Jan C8. She, she, she killed, not gonna lie. And so there are two big strengths for this novella, okay? One is the ending. It's a great Sanderlanch with character development for a character who really desperately needed it, in my opinion. And just like the general bolstering of the power dynamics going into the fourth and final book was really needed. Where a lot of things that have been building up and that have been teased are, are finally coming to fruition here, which which I like to see. Because, you know, in some of these Skyward stories, like, nothing really happens. Not naming names, Starsight, Cytonic, Sky. And with the themes, like, this is just generally better than the other Skyward stuff for me because the themes hit so hard. Uh, touching on leadership, especially. Leadership, sacrifice, uh relying on yourself versus relying on others like all of these things were touched on really well in, in an actual good way that i thought was really good writing and as i've been saying like i don't even care about the skyward characters that much but this was just done really well it was just a good like development character arc conclusion so this was just very satisfying but you know i gotta be a hater so I, I hated the other characters hated the setting there's more furries in this one that gotta stop number 44 is the way of kings but Prime, not this one. That's, that's still for later. The Way of Kings is the most iconic Sanderson book, and The Way of Kings Prime is the original draft of that book, which released in 2002. And so basically, we have The Way of Kings at home. This is just such a fundamentally flawed book. There's a lot of great aspects to it, but still, like, Sanderson had to polish it for an eventual release years later, and it's still... I've heard Brandon say in his lecture series that it's very hard to summarize The Way of Kings or pitch it to people, and the same thing goes for this book as well. But, you know, in, in my summary, in the Snakebird summary, it goes like this, okay? There's a guy named Taln, okay, T-A-L-N. So he claims he's a herald, one of these, like, ten ancient heroes who has risen again to save humanity as they fight amongst themselves in this, like, storm-ridden world. The problem is that nobody believes him, like, like, really nobody believes him, and he doesn't care about proving his case, which makes for a weird book, but one that is, like, weirdly intriguing. Really, it's Taln's POV which makes this book special, right? Because in the actual way of Kings, they're... they're is no town really kinda because the way of kings and the stormlight archives feature kaladin right kaladin's the main guy but this prime or draft version or sanderson curiosity version is just really good because town's pov is just really interesting compared to kaladin and his like il relationships with the other cast members are actually just weirdly intriguing in a way that I, it's hard to describe but once again this book is not canon so it has a lot of flaws and it's marketed for those flaws and it's just a cool insight for fans to see like oh this became this thing that is now legendary. Number 43 is The Dark Talent, which is the fifth Alcatraz book. And I've thought about how to talk about this, but I actually don't think I can without spoilers, which is a crazy thing to say about a kid's book, but we'll, we'll get into that because what makes this book good is the ending, but everything besides that is just very standard. And so with this book in particular, I think this is a good time to bring up who is the audience for these books? Because these are kid's books, but they're not like really kid's books. Like this, this book can get pretty mature and some of the, the writings like, pretty advanced like this is just such a weird series where it's a kid's book with the humor characters and aesthetic of a kid's book but it has like the the plot and the commentary of something ya like at times and so while i do think this book this book is good i do think sanderson fails sometimes when it comes to getting into the perspective of a, of a child in elementary school i read 39 clues and spirit animals and recently sanderson just came out with a podcast with the guy who who made like spirit animals or like it's a, it's a weird series where i think each of the books are written by a different author but the guy who kind of um set the blueprint for that was on the podcast and he basically told this guy like yeah i have a i have a series called alcatraz and it's middle grade to ya bro middle grade to ya no nah, like this is this is like just straight up for kids he kind of hit the mark when he said that um this book is for kids who are just much smarter than they should be but it's like side eye dog side eye i think this book in particular just makes it very apparent that the alcatraz series is in kind of like a limbo state when it comes to audience where it's like kids book versus 
YA versus middle grade versus adult. It's like, where where does this sit? It gets even more confusing when you, when you think that the Alcatraz series is older Alcatraz, like adult Alcatraz, narrating younger Alcatraz, but from the POV of his younger self. Like, genuinely, I'm just wondering who this book was made for, because, like, who's reading the series? It has to be, like, either a very small niche of smart child, or just somebody who wants to read everything Sanderson's ever put out, which is... Which is me! Number 42 is Mistborn, The Alloy of Law. I actually really liked this one. Uh, I think I like it a lot more than the average Sanderson fan, and that's just because I had a really pleasant time reading this. It's just really easy to read, although, uh, Brandon said... Brandonson. Brandon put out like a blog post saying that this is probably his worst book, which I don't agree with, but I can see why he says it. It's because it stands in comparison to other Mistborn books, and the stakes here are, are not high, and, and having high stakes is kind of what makes a Mistborn book really interesting. Because this is about a new trio of characters who are trying to stop this villain who is like, life force from Timu. That's a Reckoner's reference, but Brandon has gone on record saying that this is his worst Cosmere book, maybe even worst book. That's only just because it exists as a quintessential Cosmere book. Like once you get past Mistborn Era 1, you're, you're kind of in the depths of it and this this is kind of your entry point. And so I think he just wants this to be a lot better and fans also kind of wanted this to be a lot better. And actually all the criticism towards this book, it's very valid. Like I can't really deny any of it. Number 41 is actually The Way of Kings. I love the Stormlight Archives, but I'm not gonna just like sit here and lie. I, I did not like this book like at all when I read it. I was gonna say that that's controversial, but it actually isn't. Like this is not the type of book that everybody is going to like. In fact, many thousands, millions of people would not enjoy this book, and I am I am one of those people. Sanderson himself has a hard time pitching this book because of how complex it is, and if you generalize this book, it just sounds so much less cool than it is. But in this book specifically, you have three main POV characters. You have Surgeon turned soldier, Kaladin, Warlord turned old man, um, Dalinar, and then you have my favorite, the GOAT of this book, Shallan. I'll be honest, Shallan absolutely carried this book for me. Uh, Kaladin and Dalinar did not like reading them at all in this book, like genuinely at all. I love those two, but, in, but because of later entries. This book is technically Kaladin's book, which means that it focuses on him for these like backstory chapters, which I hated. The flashback chapters are like unwanted ads that play during like YouTube videos when you're when you're just getting into it, when you're like, okay, Dalinar's finally doing something cool. And then, oh, insert Kaladin flashback. The momentum is just like done. And this one's actually controversial, but I hate the Shattered Plains. Like nothing goes on there except like, like, I don't know, sitting around. While Shallan's the only person actually doing things. Like she's out here trying to run the biggest fade on a wizard. So once again, I love this series, but I would love it a lot more on a reread. First read was, was pretty painful. There's just so much turmoil and so little action. You know why I love Shallan is that she's a woman of action, okay? She's out here in Carbranth making, making money moves, alright? Well, Kaladin is over here just like suffering and then bro, Kaladin literally just like stays suffering while Dalinar is the thinker. He's, he's literally the thinker, like I, I can't be asked. Number 40 is Read On. This is the second of the three novellas in the Skyward Flight Collection and my favorite skyward adjacent piece kinda you'll see so like if you're reading the skyward series you should read on look i'm an open hater there are the usual grievances which i have with the skyward series here just you know the inherent cringe that thrives within every corner of this universe where it has the same lows as sunreach or evershore or you know any other skyward piece but it has the best setting in all of skyward right this planet of Redon where it is like this huge miasma tree and now I'm realizing that my argument for this book is a lot worse than uh, Evershore but it, it is it is I think just really well written and it's it's hard to say anything other than that like this book is just very unique and fresh especially as a Skyward book and the POV you get is someone that I would have like never expected so I don't know okay this is just like weirdly good it's a lot better in practice than on paper but I, I guess since this is a book, it is on paper, but yeah, like, trust me. I hate on book talk when they start off the videos like this, where you can't see the spine. But number 39 is Mistborn. The Lost Metal. The Lost Metal is the fourth and final book of Mistborn Era 2, making it the seventh uh, mainline Mistborn book in the Mistborn series. I consider my stance on this book the opposite of The Way of Kings, where I, I genuinely never think of this book ever, but it was a really good read, like, when I first read it. Besides, like, two plot-related highs, everything else in this book is kind of, like, low to mid level stuff for a Cosmere book. 
So then why this book is so high is that it just has a lot of Cosmere connections. And that in itself makes this book worth reading and a, and a lot of uh, fun to read. Like there's just too much content. This book is too substantive for me to like warrant a lower pr placement when it is a really good book. Okay, maybe not really good, but it's just really solid. And the fact that this book exists just adds to it you know like you know what i mean like it just has inherent value for what it is it's the seventh mistborn book it's the last book of era 2 it's a cosmere book with high cosmere connections so just by existence it warrants this placement but i know i can't put it any higher than this putting this higher up is, is just not right <laughs> uh, for how unimpactful this was but i stand by this this is a good book okay number 38 is legion the original legion legion number one in this first book of the detective series of the same name, we follow Mr. Stephen Leeds as he talks to his genius imaginary friends to solve international crimes, right? Straight up, this pilot was really good, but it was because of the novelty. The premise and Stephen himself are just so cool in this pilot episode where it's just really interesting to read. And it also helps that the plot in this one is, is dumb, but it's not as dumb as the other ones where you have like this time traveling camera, okay? The very first case has Stephen investigating a guy who has a camera which can take pictures of the past apparently. And so, um, low-key kind of racist. I'm Filipino, okay, so I can say this, but this low-key, like, propagates, like, Filipino stereotypes that we're all, like, deeply religious because, um, the, the culprit in question is a Filipino and he gets, um, his hands on this time-traveling camera. And so the first thing he does with a camera that can take pictures of the past is he travels to where Jesus was and he tries to prove that Jesus exists. Honestly, I just find it funny that Sanderson knows his Filipino stereotypes that well. But yeah, no, the novelty of seeing Steven for the first time, like, flex his powers and see his limitations, it's just all very cool. Since this is so short, there are just no boring moments. And unlike The Lost Metal, this is just very lacking in substance, but still just so blatantly cool that I have to put it here. Number 37 is Edge Dancer, which is the crowning jewel of the Arcanum Unbounded collection, although now I think you can just buy it like straight up as a individual solo story. Kind of a disappointing placement for me because I had really high expectations for this because it features this character named Lyft from the Stormlight Arch Archives who I thought, actually I don't even know if she's a fan favorite, but I thought she would be one of my favorite characters and she isn't. And man, like even though there's so much that goes on here, it just wasn't interesting and I think it's actually because of Lyft. Lyft to me is a character that has so much potential but just like falls a bit short. There's a lot of mystery surrounding her character, but she falls into this childish girl archetype same as Spenza, which I typically don't really like. And even though she is better than Spenza, th that, that's the thing is that she's just fine. When I thought she could be like a really good like anchor character, like like when Gojo appears in Jujutsu Kaisen, or even comparing her to like Syl from Stormlight, where Syl just like steals the moment every time she is in a moment. But yeah, I think this is objectively great, but I just wouldn't pick it up again. And so like these two novellas, I think really let me down. Actually, that's a lie. I picked it up again to verify some Cosmere stuff. But yeah, this could have been easily way higher, I feel. Number 36 is Alcatraz vs. the Shattered Lens. But it's more like Alcatraz vs. the Shattered Plains. It's actually a really good comparison. These are all so hard to talk about without spoilers, but just in general, it's one of the more higher quality Alcatraz books where a lot of the small moments and a lot of the big moments just really hit well, I think. Also, again, Shasta, Bastille, Grandpa Smedry, voice actors killed it, BGM, was amazing. Graphic audio is so good. Like, do I really have to say the line? A movie in your- With the humor in these books, Alcatraz does a lot of inserts, like in a Deadpool movie. Two Deadpool references in a video is crazy. Uh, but let me tell you, like, in this book, Alcatraz breaks way more than the fourth wall. The humor is just somehow much more toned back, I feel like, in this one, where it didn't annoy me as much and, and where I thought it was kind of endearing. It was fine. There were still these, like, weird references that, that no kid would ever understand. Like, there was, like, a I think Alcatraz said, like, get thee to a nunnery, which which is the line from um, Shakespeare's Hamlet. I don't know if any elementary school kid would, would understand that. It just lacks a lot of the negatives that I would typically find in a lot of the other Alcatraz books. And it just has Alcatraz at his best here, so it was good. Okay, this is a big one. Number 35 is Steelheart. I unfortunately have very mixed feelings about Steelheart, which keeps me from placing this higher, but this is very much my thing. Like, Steelheart is the very first book in the Reckoner series and features um, our teenage protagonist David, who is this kid who works at a gun factory. He lives in essentially what is Chicago turned Gotham City by this guy named Steelheart who is this evil superhero. I'm kind of downplaying it because he's like evil Superman. He's like one of the strongest, most invincible dudes ever. And back in the day he killed David's dad and so now David wants to get revenge and join the Reckoners, which is this rebel group, to kill Steelheart. And I hope that sounds awesome because it just 
is awesome. The start of this book is so strong, and I consumed it in audio, audio version. Like, I don't know if you can see here, but I got this. I got this book for $6. The real problems start in, like, the middle of the book when you realize that it, this is just really silly. Like, these books are just really goofy. It's pitched really interestingly, but the plot direction, uh, the characters, just the fact that David is the absolute worst makes these books incredibly, like, cringy and, and kind of hard to read sometimes. Maybe not hard to read, but at least just hard to take seriously, right? Because I love the revenge story. I love the planning, the scheming, the setting of New Chicago, Chicago, but it's eternally night and everything's been turned to steel because of Steelheart is just really cool. Steelheart himself, he's a great villain, okay? He's strong, evil, meticulous. Everybody does his bidding. He's scary. So you have all these cool things, but David is just so cringe. <laughs> Like, I kid you not, David Charleston is the worst Sanderson protagonist. He's like Alcatraz, but, like, even weirder. Basically, bro gave me the ick. Number 34 is Infinity Blade Redemption. And while the first book, I think, is objectively pretty bad and boring, this, I think, is objectively pretty bad and really exciting. Because, like, I have a tendency to enjoy things that are really scuffed, but, like, action-packed and exciting. That's a big reason why The Way of Kings is down there, right? It's because it was just very slow and painful. But even knowing all I do about the Infinity Blade franchise, this story is, was mad confusing. Like, th there, there's a lot of lacking context here where you actually need to play the games to understand how Cirrus starts off this book. Even knowing all I do about the Infinity Blade games, having done additional research for this video, and having read the book, this was still mad confusing. To even begin understanding this, you need to know what happens in the games as this, like, um, happens after the second game and is relevant to the second game but sets up the third game. Because once again, these novellas are supposed to bridge the games and fill in holes in the plot. And boy, was there some crazy plot holes. So we continue on here with Sirius' story, where he's now in this very difficult situation, both physically and mentally. And so you have this A plot of Sirius struggling, but then you also have this B plot running parallel in, like, alternate chapters to the A plot of this crazy, like, I don't even know how to describe it without spoiling, because it's genuinely, like, a different book. Like, it's this is basically two books in one. It has nothing to do with Cirrus at all. And with this book being called Infinity Blade Redemption, the title is very fitting, because there is a redemption here, which I thought was done really well. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Number 33 is Dark One, and this is the only graphic novel that Sanderson has besides White Sand, and this just gaps White Sand hard IMO just off art, this is so much better than White Sand. I don't really remember much that happens here. And I'm not gonna lie, okay, I don't remember a lot of the plot, but you know what, the, the words the words leave me, but the emotions remain. I was gonna save this for Frugal Wizard, but this one, even more so, is literally just American Isekai. Like, it's giving hero versus demon king vibes. Isekai, if you don't know, refers to this concept, usually in Japanese fiction, where the main character gets reincarnated into another world. More specifically, he gets reincarnated from our world into a fantasy world, which is basically the plot of this book. <laughs> well, actually, if you want to get real technical with it, this is this is a transmigration story where there's a guy in New York who transmigrates into a fantasy world where he finds out that he's the Demon King or, you know, the, the Dark One, where he's this evil being who all the heroes are trying their best to defeat. The two weaknesses for this book, I thought, were, were one, that the B-plot wasn't that interesting. There is a B-plot of this, you know, riveting courtroom drama, but it kind of came off like like Oppenheimer, you know, when people say like Oppenheimer was um was like too long because there was like some random courtroom drama, but people just wanted to see the bomb. And the second thing is that it just wasn't that memorable. But besides that, very intriguing book. The themes of like found family, um, like going against your destiny, all dealt with really well and really in a, in a really logical but interesting way. Paul as a protagonist is very basic but very cool. I mean, the best character. If you've read this, you, you know who the best character is, bro. That one moment sticks with me to this day. It's why this, this book is so high up, right? And how it- That's so good, so good. This is just very consistently great for how short it is. And it, it exists in comparison to White Sand, which makes it even better. Like, yeah, this, this one's pretty sick. Number 32 is Alamancer Jack and the Pits of Altania. Once again, this is found in the Arcane Unbounded Cosmere collection and is a Mistborn short story thing. It is a bit of a more tough one to describe because unlike the 11th medal, this is for more established readers and is actually a comedy, I guess. It's about 20 pages, but in the world of Mistborn, there are people called Alamancers, people who can eat metal and then burn it, you know, kind of like digest it in a way, uh, to use magical abilities dependent on what type of metal they eat. And so Alamancer Jack is this hero you hear about in passing throughout Mistborn Era 2 as this great hero with these great feats of, of, well, they're not actually that great, but this 
story is supposed to be one of his more famous adventures. This is actually a super good little entry from Sanderson. It's funny, but not in the way you would think. There are many Sanderson characters like Wayne, David, and Alcatraz who are funny through making jokes, but this is funny in like a different way. It's a very specific niche of humorous where the book is Alamancer Jack's story, but it's edited in the footnotes by his steward Handerwim. So while Jack is someone who is unintentionally funny, it's actually the commentary by Handerwim which makes the book like truly funny. I've read the book Babel by R.F. Kuang, and that's the only book in which footnotes have been used in a way that I think is like comparable to this at all. And still, the usage here is like completely different. Instead of being very serious, these footnotes are used as like, like presidential debate fact checkers, but like very lightheartedly. I don't know how else to pitch the format other than that, but this is just a very quirky, short, fun little Cosmere story, so I liked it. Number 31 is The Sunlit Man. This is actually the last Sanderson book I ever read. I saved it for the end because I thought it would be really, really cool. The Sunlit Man is a Cosmere standalone. It is one of the four projects that Sanderson wrote um, during COVID and then eventually released on Kickstarter, which is the number one Kickstarter of all time. It's like 40 plus million or something like that. He actually has the number three spot as well, which is crazy for the new Cosmere RPG. This book was quite wonderful, but I was still like quite disappointed by it as a whole. I think a lot of people, myself included, were looking forward to this because the premise is so strong. For one, it features a character named Nomad, which is a very fan favorite popular character, almost a spoiler who's being chased by this mysterious organization called the Night Brigade to this crazy planet where the sun is just so hot that it eviscerates everything it touches and turns the soil to like magma and stuff. So like many Sanderson stories, the strong point for me here is the world. Not even just the setting, the cool planet and the ecology and the people there, but it's also just the culture and the aesthetic of the civilization. You know, how do people live on a planet where every single surface is eviscerated by the sun? But because he nailed the world, I had such high expectations for the character and plot, which were just not as good. Something like Edge Dancer had no character that I loved, but here it at least had Auxiliary, which is a character who just carries the book. And as this is a Cosmere standalone, there are a lot of characters, you know, like uh, Cinder King, Elegy, uh, Rebecca. This is a very mid Sanderson book. Uh, it's classic, it's predictable, but just Ox and the cool setting saved this one from mediocrity. So bringing this out again, number 30 is Shadows for Silence in the Forest of Hell. Absurdly long title. So we're in bronze. Um, I guess like the original, this is another one of those books that is just um, not for me, although it is objectively incredibly good. What makes this one really unique though is that it's a Cosmere horror book, and horror is a genre that I, I really don't like because I get scared easily. But this book features a world where there are these ghost monsters and humanity just lives in fear of them, and these ghosts get increasingly more aggressive at night, and so the only thing that repels them is silver, and so that's like the highest um, economic tier of commodity. So this short story focuses on a woman who is an innkeeper of all things in this literally godforsaken world because it is this one safe space and she just has a lot of silver. Also, unlike a lot of the other Cosmere books, uh, the Cosmere connections here are, are, are just like very, very slight, I feel like. You can dive more into that for sure, but really this is just a great standalone with great characters and like great direction really. The only problem is that it's, it's really short. And so I read this and, and I wanted to see more from the world, and I know more from the world is coming, but I, at the same time I'm also not fiending for it. Like, I, I think it would just be nice to have more of the world. Number 29 is... Firefight, which is, which is this book. I tried so hard and I truly could not get my hands on a copy of Firefight. My library system had one copy of Firefight and someone was, was reading it, but I guess they just like never returned it or something because that copy is just gone from the system. But I won't deny that this is a very bad book, okay? Like, um, this is probably easily the worst Reckoners book. Despite being called Firefight, they actually take on a water level in this one. So, you know, the Reckoners series is about taking down these evil superheroes called Epics. And so there is an Epic in New York who has encased the entire city in water. Uh, and so everybody there has to kind of like live in like oxygen bubbles, I guess. They just have to live underwater. And let's be real, like, just like in video games, Nobody likes the water level, okay? Like, this tried to be Super Mario Sunshine and it became, um, Fontaine, so. Like, they literally use this thing called a spiral, which is this, um, like, device, which is basically just Flood from Mario. <laughs> that being said, this is this high up because I I'm just terrible. Like, I just enjoy things like this. Like, it's so bad, but it's so good at the same time. I would never recommend this to anybody, but man, I, I can't say anything because of the spoilers, but this book is just so absurd. It had me, like, reacting, like, in real time, like, crying, laughing, cringing. Actually, maybe not crying, but maybe crying laughing. I apologize for my behavior, but it is my list, so it is what it is. Number 28 is Alcatraz versus the Scrivener's Bones. Not just as an Alcatraz book or as a kid's book, but just as a book, this is like really good. 
Alcatraz vs. the Scrivener's Bones is the second installment of the Alcatraz vs. the Evil Librarian series. And in this installment, him and some of his old and new friends go to the secret lair of the Scriveners in the Library of Alexandria to pull off a heist. Now that I say that out loud, it does kind of sound like bootleg Mistborn, but it, it's very good. While the first book is the pilot episode, it is the introduction to the world, right? To Alcatraz, to the Free Kingdoms, the Hushlands. Um, the second installment really narrows the scope down, and it focuses on uh, Alcatraz's fight with one of the three mi main librarian factions, the Scriveners, who are like the best villains in the Alcatraz universe. They're actually such good villains, they're like these immortal undead skeletons who actually don't really fight. You, you actually have to win a mental battle against them. They're really just scammers, so Alcatraz has to go against them in a battle of wits and, and lock in for once. Sanderson is known for his rules-based magic systems, and so this is him integrating his signature style into a kid's book, and surprisingly it works like really well, so. Number 27 is the Frugal Wizard's Guide. I meant handbook, okay, I'm sorry for surviving medieval England. Absurdly long name, but I'ma say it, overhated Sanderson book, okay? This is one of the four secret project books, and because it's the only one of the four which is not a Cosmere book, I think people tend to think very negatively of this. Because just being a Cosmere book gives a book inherent value. I mean, just look at any book from Mistborn Era 2. This super goofy standalone though is about a guy named John who wakes up one day in medieval England, and so he has to go out and find out why he's there, go out and learn about this alternate magical Celtic culture. Just looking at this book and knowing about the amnesia protagonist thing just made me think that this was going to be a bad book off rip, especially with many of the comics that I do consume dealing with, you know, regression, reincarnation, transmigration, a lot of the same tropes. This is basically gentrified nano machine. But honestly, in, in its entirety, this is a pretty good book. The biggest negative is that it drags for like a really long time. Like the drag in this is, is pretty harsh. Yeah, like the beginning and middle should be like half the length if I'm being honest. The thing is though, is that this, this book is weird, but not in a cool way, which I think is also the point. Because to summarize this book in one word is absurd. Like the unbelievability is, is turned up to the max to the point where everything is just crazy. But the thing is though, I feel like it's unbelievably unbelievable to prove a point. So it's doing this in a meaningful way. Because there is clear intent behind making characters abnormally strange, the world abnormally weird, the interactions so over the top, and to have characters intentionally flawed in extreme ways, I think I've, I've really appreciated in this book, and it ties well within the themes of like found family, of looking at the flaws within yourself. The protagonist John is one of my favorite Sanderson protagonists because of this. He's comedically a loser in like the most unrealistic degree, but then that actually plays in to, you know, the, a theme of like standing up for yourself, right? It's actually crazy. This man, John, like he he is like he gets bullied by everybody and and his like character is built in to be like the most loser of all losers so yeah i could sit, sit here and be like the cast is filled with a bunch of freaks because it is but i felt like i read this and i understood like immediately why everything is the way it is which is a very rare moment for me to have in a sanderson book and you know what the plot actually progresses in a very reasonable and fulfilling manner and so it ends in a very satisfying conclusion so yeah minus the fact that this book is like too long great book me thinks. Number 26 is Dragonsteel Prime and it like straight up this is underrated. Like this is another Sanderson curiosity, another one of his unreleased works which he now releases as bonus content and this I think is like levels above some of his released works. I know that eventually there will be a canon version of this, maybe not for a couple decades, but still this was very well put together in my opinion. This is about a boy named Jarek whose defining quality is, is being poor and so the king who's like really dumb but surprisingly progressive, uh, goes to Jarek and, he, and he's like, hey, um, I'm, I'm running an RCT, okay? I'm wondering if I give you a peasant equal opportunity and equal op education as the noble kids, will you do as good as them? Yeah, very progressive. So he just invites Jarek to the castle and he tells him, hey, in three years time, I'm going to test you and I hope you score as good, if not better than all these noble kids. There are a lot of elements here I can praise. The glorified elementary school drama goes so crazy. It reminded me of when I was a kid reading Harry Potter and I just love those class classroom um, scenes where they were learning potions or they were learning Quidditch and it was like Draco versus Harry. Like it was so good. I love like the different dynamics that the students have with one another and with their teachers where they all have a different view on education and they have a different background which plays into you know how they view the world. It's so good. Like the magic in the world are, are lacking for sure but the quality and the scope of, of the world is there it just needs refinement. And of course this, this book features one of the most 
iconic, beloved Sanderson characters of all time in Topaz. Maybe they're not the same character that we know in the mainline books, but still, like, it's cool to see the original, original Topaz. So yeah, the second half of the book is also great, uh, except for the, well, actually, it, it maybe it isn't. Like, the whole Way of Kings section that was ripped out and just put into the Way of Kings, I, I didn't really enjoy, but I also just didn't enjoy the Way of Kings. This would probably be a lot higher if it wasn't for that. Also, the ending kind, kind of sucked, but... You know, just a very high quality draft from basically when I was born, so I like this a lot. Number 25 is Sixth of the Dusk. Uh, Cosmere Jurassic Park, that's all I'll say. Not really, but this is a really enjoyable Cosmere short story that was conceptualized through Brandon's podcast, and now the finished version resides in the Arcanum Unbounded Cosmere Collection, which is over there and I'm not getting it, okay? This is about a native hunter on this overly dangerous island, and then there are these magical birds which give these natives their, their like, magical powers. It's actually so, so cool. It's very Pokemon-coded, where these different birds have different types, and each type has a different power that they can give to the natives, and then there's, like, the mystery of how these birds came about, how do they have powers? How do these powers work? Unlike a lot of other Sanderson books, this one especially, everything about it, characters, thematically, uh, magic system, everything about this is just very, very likable to me. And put into practice, all of the ideas are just wonderfully done, I thought. Ideas like, who is the apex predator? What does it mean to be an apex predator? Uh, what did Ayano Koji say? Like, like man is wolf to man? Dusk and Vati are actually a delight to read about, okay? Like, just having them come with their own two different sets of problems and having them on this island being forced to interact and then problem solve together from two very different perspectives is just great. The culture built in this short story I just thought was amazing. It's one of my favorites and um, I saw the announcement actually. I, I was watching it live for Isles of the Ember Dark. I'm very excited for that next year. That is technically Secret Project 5. It's a full novel in sequel to this story and I will be there no matter what. I watched that announcement live. It was very hype. This one surprised me. Number 24 is Dark One Forgotten. Okay, so look, Dark One Forgotten is a audiobook side story in the Dark One universe to the Dark One comic book. This is a collaboration between Brandon Sanderson and his fellow podcast co-host Dan Wells, who every Sanderson fanboy definitely knows. Dan is known for his true crime type of stories. I think his biggest hit is um, I Am Not a Ser Serial Killer, which I saw, um, I saw Ludwig did a video on. I do actually want to check that one out eventually. But this audiobook, or as the wiki calls it, an audio drama, is set in the form of a true crime podcast. But this book in podcast form is about this music student named Christina Walsh who starts up her own podcast uh, diving into this case that she found out of a very famous violinist who everybody in the world just forgot about. Basically, she fell off, but at the same time she was, she was just like straight up murdered. Throughout this podcast style audiobook, Christina and her friend document their journey in researching, investigating, and interviewing people for this murder case. And I actually really hated this at first, but the more I listened, the more I was invested. Not in like the Cosmere way, but in like the interested way. And yeah, I don't really like like true crime or horror, and Dan Wells definitely has a style, and he killed it. He, him and Jancy Patterson kind of killed their, their Sanderson collaborations. So surprisingly, I really, really like this. I was so invested. And I know Dan is doing the prose version of Dark One, which is going to co cover, I think, this one and the comic book in a novel format. And I think he's also working on something called, like, the Apocalypse Guard. I saw that somewhere. That's another Sanderson collab for, I think, a YA series. And he's almost definitely going to do a, co a Cosmere book down the line because he's such a big Dragonsteel partner and friend of Sanderson's. All in all, absolutely, like, horrible ending. We don't talk about that. Number 23 is Lux. And actually, this is the one that I'm most excited to talk about because this might be like the biggest standout in Sanderson's discography for me. I was really debating putting this near the bottom because it was like near skyward levels of unenjoyment for me. But man, th this thing stuck with me for, for months. It's been a couple months since I read it or I guess listened to it because it is another uh, Audible exclusive, audiobook exclusive. But look, open and honest. I have a ton of praise for this book. I, I like... um. There was, there was a lot of unenjoyment reading it, like The Way of Kings, but unlike The Way of Kings, I felt like the unenjoyment was really, like, structurally and fundamentally in every scene built into this book, because it was only unenjoyable to me because I was waiting for the demise of a certain character. What is this book? Well, it is probably the best written Reckoners book, in my opinion. Reckoners is a, is a trilogy, right? Steelheart, Firefight, Calamity, and in between books one and two is the side story of Mitosis. Well, this is another side story, part of the Texas Reckoners. 
I don't know if it's going to be a series, but it, it is just called like the Texas Reckoners. It is a 14 hour audiobook side story, which runs parallel to books two and three in the Reckoner series. While the original Reckoners books have David as a protagonist, Lux has Jax as a, as a protagonist. Jax has a similar backstory, but with like drastically different strengths. Unlike David, he actually goes through formal training as an assassin to kill these Reckoners. Or not, oh, not to kill the Reckoners. So like when his family was killed, right, he was an orphan, and then the leader of the Reckoners came, he picked him up, and he just trained him for like a decade. And while David's strengths are his creativity and his planning, Jax's strengths are his, are literally like his, his physical strength and his logical intellect. Because during the day, Jax trains like with, with his sword. He has a sword. That's that's already cooler than David, right? But then he also lifts weights and then at night he goes into the lab, he puts on his white lab coat and he just runs like chemistry experiments. And so he approaches killing superheroes, not from like the creative, wacky kind of um, perspective of David, but from a very logical perspective where he really breaks down their powers in the lab and thinks, okay, so this person has a fire power. What is the best way like molecularly that I can counteract that? This man's so cool, like he just like swings his sword during the day and at night he like titrates into and runs like acid base experiments. Like So the two biggest strengths in this book is that A, Jax bodies David. Jax is so much of a better protagonist than David and that's not even saying much because David is just the worst Sanderson protagonist, right? But then also, the villain in this book is incredible. Life Force, one of my favorite villains. He's just so evil and unhinged that it, it, it actually impacts the enjoyability of the book because you're just waiting for him to come around again. Like, you don't care about any of these minor villains. You just want to see David, or not David, Um, nobody wants to see David. You just want to see Jax versus Life Force, right? I could talk about this for so long, but I'll just leave it at that for now. Just very awesome book. Number 22 is Mistborn, The Final Empire. I, I had a copy of this, obviously, because this, this was my first Sanderson book, but uh, I gave my copy away to a kid overseas who was like, who, who, who liked fantasy books. And he was looking for one to read, so I, I just gave it away to him. Mistborn and The Way of Kings are probably like the two defining Sanderson books, right? Because they are the two first books in his two most popular series as a acclaimed sci-fi fantasy author. Mistborn was my first Sanderson book. Uh, I just saw a TikTok of um, Sanderson recommend it the other day to, uh, to someone who was asking, like, how do I get into his books? And I think just everybody who recommends Sanderson uh, to somebody who's just getting into it says, hey, you're getting into Sanderson, read Mistborn first. Start with Mistborn though, You right? start with Mistborn. Okay. So that's the, probably the best place to start. It was good. That's actually all I have to say, kind of, because it, this is one of those books where it just is good, and it just exists as something that is good, and that's it. Like, I don't really have any critiques other than that I, I didn't love it. Like, there is that one thing that Sanderson always says where at the very end of the book, there is this this weird power up that a character gets that is just very unwarranted, but like I didn't even know that until I heard Sanderson say it. So, but again, Mistborn is a fantasy series where people can eat metal and then they, they get different powers depending on what metal they eat. This first book specifically is a cross between a heist and a gothic drama where the world has been covered in ash and turned post-apocalyptic by this godlike being called the Lord Ruler. Sanderson has literally the best lecture series I've ever seen on YouTube uh, for multiple years too. And he says that this is basically what happens um, when the bad guy wins, right? He wanted to write a book to say, hey, what would happen if Voldemort won? What would happen if uh, Sauron won, right? But really, I'm gonna pull back the veil for you. Uh, not the one from Stormlight, but this book is really just what, like, like a cross section between what happens when a group of thieves tries to run a fade on God, on God, and when you have a orphan girl who wants to fit into royal society. So that's all I got for you, just a great book. Uh, it gained some points for being my first Sanderson book, and also just for being really watertight in like basically any category that you could rank a book in, I think. Number 21 is Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarians. Book one. Out of all six Alcatraz books, the, the first one's the best in my opinion, and the reason being that it's just so foolproof, I think. It has the novelty of being introduced to everything cool about the world, the Three Kingdoms, right? Hushlands, Smedry Talents, Alcatraz, Bastille, uh, Grandpa Smedry, right? The villain is the best in the... Actually, not, well, it's not the best. The, the um, what are, the Scriveners are way better. But the villain is just very, very solid. As Alcatraz books are these kids' books, middle grade, whatever you want to say, uh, they have a lot of recurring themes and tropes, and those themes and tropes start here, right? This is the originator of all those things. When I think of Alcatraz, I think of this book, right? The, the other entries are just 
lesser iterations in my mind of, of what this was. And as I said, it's kind of hard for Alcatraz books to land, I think, because they are this weird combination of kids books versus middle grade versus YA versus just like an adult book, which was written by an adult, right? So there's a very thin line, which I think was crossed to, to a very slight degree in later books, where it's only in this book that I think Sanderson balanced all of those aspects well and made it work this well. That one might actually be controversial, but you know, I think I love this book. It covers mad ugly though, still. Number 20 is Firstborn. We starting the top 20 off with a banger because this is just such an awesome sci-fi short story about this guy whose name is Dennison, who is a space fleet commander, who is the younger brother of this guy named Varion, who is like the intergalactic Duke Dennis. While Dennison is a notoriously bad fleet commander, known for losing basically every fight that he touches, Varion is like the most genius of genius tacticians who everybody hails as like God's chosen guy can never lose a fight. Like there is unprecedented levels of Varion glaze within the galaxy. And the thing is, Dennison doesn't even want to command troops. Bro just wants to chill. But nah, everybody's like, yo, you're the younger brother of Varion, the greatest of greatest tacticians that we have ever known. I am going to give you as many fleets as you want. Because you are related to him, because you share his blood, you have to become a genius fleet commander as well. Like, you have to be. Like, just, just give you, like, one week, I'm sure you can be a genius fleet commander. Bro, I want people around me, like, like the ones around Dennison. This guy just loses again and again and again. And everybody's like, ah, oh, well, you know, you'll, you'll get him next time. I know you will because you're, you know, you're related to Varion. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like, the problem is that Varion realizes that hey, I'm winning every battle. I have just, I already rule the galaxy. Like he, he just wins every battle. So he, he got to a point where he's like, I already like rule everybody. So he turns his eyes to the upper management and he's like, guys, I've won every battle. There's no, there's no one else left. I'm just gonna dethrone you. I'm just gonna stage a rebellion. Bro is the epitome of who gon' stop me. Actual insanity. The Denison versus Varian beef, it was like peak Naruto versus Sasuke. Like it's so ridiculous and unbelievable and I love it. Number 19 is Legion, Lies of the Beholder. Lies of the Beholder is the third and final Stephen Leeds story found within the Legion Many Lives of Stephen Leeds collection. Third and final is in quotations kinda because this does close out Stephen's story, but it also doesn't really in, in like in reality, like in the real world that we live in, because in 2022, they released Death and Faxes, which is just another episode of Stephen's story. But just in this book, there are only three stories and this is the last one. That's what I mean to say. This is another daring pick because what makes this good has little to nothing to do with the previous entries in this series. Um, but in addition to that, the beginning of, and middle of Lies of the Beholder are, are, are pretty bad. It's just the ending that's really good. And with a story like this, it'll only hit for a very small amount of people, I think. And I just happen to fall within that small amount of people. Because when I say this ending is good, I mean it was like incredibly like emotionally like powerful. I think this third Legion story is a miss on almost all aspects for almost all people. But Brandon writes in the preface of this book that it is a very personal story to him. And I can see that. And I can see like like what he was going for. And it just, it just happened to land with me, right? Because what I like about this entry is that Steven actually doesn't really look towards solving a case as much as he just looks within, within himself, and it's more more him asking himself tough questions and making tough decisions about um, life in a, with a very different perspective. For once, there's a case to be solved, but he's actually not looking towards that case. He's looking beyond the case with a perspective that's widened by the cases that he already did solve. This is the only Legion story that I took seriously. It made me feel emotion and solemnness towards the series as a whole. And even then, like, this is, this is very rare also. I, I just want to make it very clear that I think a lot of people would read this book and think it, it's very bad. <laughs> like, like, like straight up, okay? But for me personally, I thought this was very, like, heartfelt and emotional. And forget, like, book ending. I thought as a series ending, this was just killer. To me, it was just very relatable, philosophical, and just landed extremely well, so. Number 18 is Mistborn, Well of Ascension. Well of Ascension is the second book in the original Mistborn trilogy, and while the first book is this grand introduction to this dystopian world where you have this heist and commoner to princess story, the second book is literally just Balloon's Tower Defense. But man, this is great. Like, I loved it. The middle section, especially, of this book is so strong, I think. Mistborn Era 1 books are just so tense because of how impossible the odds are against the main cast. Like, the world is, is basically destroyed, right? And these people are, are really like living day to day, hour to hour, second by second. That tenseness, which gives you like mad anxiety is, is what makes these books good in my opinion. So there's only like two infractions for me with this. One is that they should have not added in that character. You you know, if you've, if you've read this book, you know who I'm talking about. 
that character was a mistake, okay? And the second thing is just the ending. It was very abrupt. Like, it wasn't even abrupt in, like, a good way. But, I, I mean, I mean, at least it made me want to read the third one, like, that much faster. But it really, like, cut everything off. But what can I say other than that? This book has such overwhelming death, and it's, like, death. Yeah, both depth and death. Uh, but yeah, I'm glad Zane left One Direction. Number 17 is Words of Radiance. It was cool. Number 16 is Towers of Midnight. Man, The Wheel of Time is so bad. It's my favorite series. Sanderson went crazy on this. Once again, The Wheel of Time, legendary fantasy series, known for its length, 5 million words-ish, by the great Robert Jordan. But he died at book 11, so then books 12, 13, and 14 were written by Sanderson to complete the series. This entire book's a spoiler, so it's really hard to talk about what I liked. But I will say that I think that Sanderson did drop the ball a bit, which... It, it's it's understandable and it, it's so hard because like he didn't even write the first 11 books right he's going off of notes um but he did with my favorite character who who i i treasure dearly i loved seeing their rise from books like you know 3 to 11. you should know who that is if you know but this was i think supposed to be their book where they had a lot of very cool moments uh you know with this but a lot of the hype moments that i was looking forward to just didn't hit when i read them I don't know if that's because of Sanderson, but you know what? I'm going to give Sanderson the opposite of the benefit of the doubt because I swear this character was so cool before Sanderson took over and now they read like like so cringy and edgy. I don't even know like this character that I loved it used to be like Buggy from One Piece, okay? Where they would like unintentionally fail and unintentionally do good and do better. They would just fail upwards, right? Where they would try their best to stick to themselves and truly like like genuinely try to, to be selfish but the world just wouldn't let them okay if i think about it this character is so overpowered if i could just list all of their powers and all of their feats i'm like wait this character is kind of broken but the thing is though that they never read like that to me until sanderson took over and then it was just very blatant that this person just comes off now like like Ayana Koji, okay? That's like the third Ayana Koji reference in this video, but still, it makes me so sad thinking about it because kind of their appeal was that they were low-key and they tried their best to not be overpowered, but they just were, right? And they would always succeed despite what they wanted. I think just inherently because of Brandon's writing style, which I love, this character, whose entire like personality was ba based upon nuance, was just kind of ruined, unfortunately. And full disclosure, like, I'm cherry-picking, like, look at the length of this book, okay? There, there's so much that goes on here, but that that was just something very important to me. Other than that, I can't tell you much. Number 15 is Mistborn, The Bands of Mourning. Mistborn, how I get bands in the morning. The Bands of Mourning is the sixth Mistborn book. It is the third in Mistborn Era 2 and my favorite of the Mistborn Era 2 books. Although I do think Mistborn Era 2 is significantly worse than Era 1, this is the highlight to look out for. I'm very big on characters before anything else, and I think every character here had their best performance in all in all the Mistborn Era 2 books. Like the main trio of Wax, Wayne, Marassi. Marassi killed in this book, by the way. But even all the other side characters like Steris, uh, Milan, Alik, all very wonderful to read on the page. The villain was boring, but that's expected of an Era 2 book. So I'm, main I'm mainly concerned that the conflict around the villain was just very good. Like it was as tense as well maybe not the era one books but it, it was getting there right and that tenseness is what makes a good mistborn book in my opinion it was just action-packed and what holds it back is just that inherent comparison to era one but like i mean that can't be helped right there is just a general unpolishedness surrounding era two maybe it's because it is just so complex and the complexity builds after every book that it's just hard to keep track with every plot twist i do actually have to really think and try to understand what's going on because it's just so complex every book and my comprehension is going down still like this is just the pinnacle of everything good that Era 2 brought to the table, in my opinion. Number 14 is Rhythm of War. Spren, so confusing. This was a tough one to rank, let me tell you. Rhythm of War, by this point in time, is the fourth and most current release of the Stormlight Archives, Brandon Sanderson's big epic fantasy series. Stormlight 5 will be releasing in two months, which is crazy to think about, but this book is weird, and in a way that I have decided that I like. Just in general, all my predictions about this book were wrong, it is not what I expected it to be. At this point in the series, the books kept on expanding in scale, but when it came to this book, it actually it actually shrunk. It actually went back to a very micro-scale problem. But like, look, right? I love Stormlight. Like, straight up, I love the series. I think this book, specifically, had the most amount of negatives by a, a large margin, but still, I really like it. I just had the most qualms with this book. For example, the character POVs. Even though I didn't like, for let's say, Dalinar and Kaladin's perspectives. 
from the first book, right? This one has some new POVs. And man, they're 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 equally pretty bad, I think. The new one in this book especially, I thought was really really hard to read. And the POV in this book that everybody likes and I think has looked forward to, I I also didn't like because I don't like science. Just in general, there was a lot of science and banter here, which I, I just did I didn't really mess with. There were many moments that I think are pretty legendary from this book that I can't say because they're spoilers. You know, a lot of um, philosophical advice and a lot of cool moments of glory. But the ending of this book is, is absolutely outrageous. It's just so insane because like I didn't even like the ending when I read it and I didn't even comprehend it. To this day, I still don't really comprehend everything that was going on in the ending, but it just lives in my head rent free. So it's weird. It's been a year since I read this book almost. And the more time that passes, the more I think positively about this book and realize that it just sticks with me more than the first two books in the series. Like I'm a guy who likes very simple, happy books, okay? And this book is is not that. Like it's very serious. Like look out how many pages there are in this. This is unbelievable work. This is serious. This is intense. And I read the ending to this, and I was like, this is just uh, this is outrageous. Like how could you do this to me, Sanderson? Come on, man. Like like what are we doing here? I I, I actually cannot forgive this man. I do not have the capacity. That's like you know two to three ideals down for me to have that capacity. This is just a dense, multifaceted book that that just give me so much inner turmoil. But you know what, I think that was the point, so so curse you Sanderson, you you won, okay? You beat me. Number 13 is The Emperor's Soul, and surprisingly I didn't love this, but I think this book is just straight up too good not to like. And it's about art, and I love art, so. The Emperor's Soul is a Cosmio short story, it's what won Sanderson his Hugo Award, but this is about a mystical artist who is put in prison and is tasked with recreating this person's soul, and not just any person, but the Emperor. The best part of this book is the philosophical commentary surrounding this. The existential ideas brought to life, pun intended, are made interesting because of this really micro-level, intimate scenario of this day-to-day -day artist's life where there is like this countdown ticking of and question of both morality but also will this artist just straight up finish their deadline. But the cool thing about the protagonist giving this series commentary is that she's not just smart, she's wise, right? So it's like you're in your favorite class with your favorite teacher learning your favorite subject. That's the difference between this and a lot of other Sanderson works, where this is just packaged levels above some of his other stuff. Number 12 is Defending Elysium. This is one of the very last pieces of Sanderson writing that I consumed before making this video. Making it almost a year since I was subjected to the Skyward series, and I cannot tell you like how surprised I was when I finished this. Because I knew that this existed as this unofficial official like Skyward prequel, so I knew it would be unpolished and disconnected from like the other Skyward stuff, right? Which is expected because this came out in 2009, but um, Jason of the Phone Company, which is a cool nickname, first of all. But he's the character type I like of like the honored one, right? But in the story, Jason Wright works for this phone company who has a monopoly on all alien tech, right? All FTL communications, all uh, weaponry, making this phone company like exponentially more important than the government. This is not a deep story by any means, but it is a very good short story, which surprisingly is Skyward adjacent. I didn't think I would have like a, a, a Skyward anything in the top 20. But this is just really good prequel stuff that I actually didn't hate for once. Like, you get to see the early diplomacy talks between humans and aliens. You get to see, like, really the origin of the Cytoverse, right? Apparently, I saw on Reddit that eventually the characters in this will be canon. Or if this isn't canon already, it will eventually be canon, which I'm looking forward to. Jason Wright of the phone company better be back. But yeah, like, this is such a vibe pick. But at the same time, if anything Skyward related can be this good, I think it's worthy of this placement, so. Number 11 is The Hope of Elantris. This is incredibly unfair to put this up against like other works because this is so short but yet so perfect all the way through. Like Words of Radiance, Towers of Midnight, these are extremely dense books that are very intricate and this is just very, very simple. I just have such a, like, a bias and love for Cell, like the world of Elantris, and this is basically just another Elantris chapter. So even though it feels cheap, it, it can't be helped. This is just a very wonderful companion piece to Elantris, I think. Part of that is because Elantris was Brandon's first published book, so it was just inherently ridden with holes and this like fills in those gaps, you know? Not all of them, but some of them, right? Because not to spoil the Sanderlanch, but the ending of Elantris got me wondering so many things. And I read this and I was like, oh wait, like, I, I love this. Like, it, it makes a lot more sense now. So sue me, all right? I love this thing. And the story of how this came about is, is very sweet. The main character in this, Matisse, is named after one of his wife's old students when she was a, a teacher. And so when Brandon was significantly less famous, this young girl made an Elantris book report and presented it to Brandon's wife, not knowing that she was Brandon's wife. And you know, as a way of giving back, Matisse in this book is named after the Matisse in real life. So I definitely butchered that name, but like read the preamble to this, it's so cute. Number 10 is Tress of the Emerald Sea. 
Top 10, here we go. This is like really the cream of the crop. Out of the four secret projects, this was the first of the four to release and the one that I think is the fan favorite. It's so good to the point where I think Brandon recommends this as a good starting point to just his books in general. I don't know if I agree with that. I think Mistborn is still the best starting point, but this is still an incredibly good book. The beginning to this book is the strongest of any Sanderson book, I think. It captivated me instantly and pulled me in, which is very hard because my attention span isn't that good. And when I start reading a book, right, like I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not that invested yet. But literally like 40 pages in, I knew this was going to be top five. Um, it actually wasn't top five because I read the remainder of the book and I realized that I didn't like the direction it went. But still, the beginning of this was incredible. The best parts of this book are these little ordinary moments, which Sanderson scales up. So he like provides commentary, this philosophical commentary on very... Um, mundane things, but he relates them to life in a way that is just so sick. Like he attributes commentary to a mundane action to make it larger than life, if that makes sense. And that's what I want to talk about with this specific book, is that it's very unique. Sanderson is known for his very simple, straightforward, and easy to understand prose. I'm a big Tudor Ramble fan, which is like a book podcast between these two guys. And then one of them, uh, Austin said that Brandon once said, so this is like, you know, information like three to four layers down that uh, his writing, he wants his prose to be like a normal window where uh, someone like Tolkien or George R.R. R. Martin, their prose is like um, like a stained glass window. With his word choice, he wants comprehension to be as high as possible while giving up some of that, that style, right? That being said, the prose in this book is unlike anything he's ever written. That's because this book is actually narrated by a character who is a fan favorite and they talk very humorously, which makes the book very whimsical in its prose. So everything combined, right? That character's narration, the prose, the fact that this is just a, a recent Sanderson work, right? Where he's had time to develop as an author. Everything combined just makes for a very witty and beautiful novel that is like unlike anything Sanderson writes normally. This is another one I've been looking forward to. Number nine is Calamity. The name is beyond fitting because this book is catastrophically abysmal, but man, is it entertaining. When I say that I enjoy greatly scuffed but entertaining things, I, I mean it, okay? I'm a man of honesty. Calamity is the third and final book of the Reckoners trilogy, and it is one of the books of all time. I bring this idea up to people a lot that something can be so bad that it circles back around to being good again, and this piece of fiction has- it was so incredibly bad that is it has circled around like three times over and become incredible. It finally clicked to me when I was reading this what I dislike about the series, and that's that the characters feel fake. They are in no way realistic, and so they, they just like read as silly characters in my mind. There is just no dimension that I can take this book seriously, and so every time they do try to have a serious moment, like I, I just can't take them seriously. There are so many good twists in this book, but with the characters and the setup failing them, like there's just no bearing to them. Like if the characters and the setting were on point, a lot of these moments would actually be really powerful. There are so many good twists in this book that actually fail to land because of the setting and the characters and the plot. But at the same time, it was so sick. Like, I I'm saying all this just to say that my enjoyment of this book is purely ironic and I am aware, okay? I enjoyed this book way too much, but I enjoyed it so much. This is the most scuffed Sanderson book of all time, bar none. Nothing even comes remotely close to this. This is one of a kind, one of the books of all time. Number eight is A Memory of Light. This is genuinely impossible, like I cannot even begin to describe to you the levels of impossibility that was achieved like with this book. The Herculean task that was handed to Sanderson that he had the chance to decline but he accepted like a warrior. Once again just to recap, A Memory of Light is the 14th book of the Wheel of Time series. Brandon Sanderson called to finish the Wheel of Time series, right? W wrote books 12, 13, 14, uh, Robert Jordan wrote the first 11, and by him accepting to write the, the ending of the Wheel of Time series, right? Like to be the guy that not only has to follow in Robert Jordan's footsteps, but to be the guy that changes the prose, right? And has to conclude the series in a way that satisfies fans, but also honors Robert Jordan's legacy. It's impossible, like it's fourth quarter, Robert Jordan's legacy is on the line and you have to make like a half court shot to a court in another city. Like it's a futile task. The series has nearly 3000 characters and all these character like arcs need to conclude in a single book. And so, you know, he, he split the one book into three books, but still, like, how is anybody supposed to do that? And look, of course I have my qualms with the book, okay? Like, look at this book. It's massive. There's so much that goes on here, and of course, like, a lot of the moments here didn't land with me, right? But I don't care. I'm glazing, okay? Like, this is inhuman levels of achievement. You know, in the preamble to this, by Brandon, he, he says that, like, 
guys, nobody besides Robert Jordan can finish these books, but I'm gonna try anyway. Like, like that's the real strength before weakness. And so look, I'm still gonna be honest, right? Like a lot of the Wheel of Time books, actually all of them besides this book, are very slow paced with very little action sequences, right? This one, incredibly fast paced, kinda, with many action sequences. Even though there was a lot going on, it still felt pretty slow to me, but still like, man oh man did things happen. Reading a Wheel of Time book is like beating a FromSoft game like Dark Souls and Elden Ring, right? Where I just look at these people who have completed a Wheel of Time book, even just the first one, right? And I'm like, congrats and respect. You have my you have my highest degree of respect because that is a hard thing. I read all 14 books. It was incredibly hard to do, to read. The whole series is like over 4 million words. Like, you, do you even understand like how many words that is? So Wheel of Time readers actually just have to respect one another because it's just a shared, it's, it's like trauma bonding where you see a person who has gone through trials and tribulations to complete the same task that you did, right? Like beating a FromSoft game boss. And you're just like, wow, respect, dude. Dude, you killed it. The first-hand understanding of how impressive that is is something that just cannot be con like, like conveyed through this camera. You, you actually have to just read these books to understand. There's just so many levels to it. Like the fact that a small amount of the population reads fantasy books, right? And e an even smaller amount will take on these. And then an even smaller amount will finish them. It's just a different level of, of respect. A lot of things in this ending didn't land with me and that's very natural because a lot did and this is just too dense there's just too many ideas and characters and, and things happening in this book for things not to land and so i really enjoyed this number seven is mistborn secret history i have to be very careful what i say because this entire book is a spoiler but mistborn secret history is a cosmere short story in the mistborn series and it should be read i think between books six and seven so books three and four of mistborn era two that being Bands of Mourning and The Lost Metal. And it is about a certain character who I didn't like that much originally, but this changed my perspective of them. This made me realize the error of my ways because just front to back filled with revelations. The implications of this little novella for the Cosmere as a whole, you know, other Cosmere books, uh, just the Mistborn series even, like everything is just mind blowing. I understand why I haven't seen much about this book, because uh, everything about it is a spoiler, you can't really talk about it without spoiling. But at the same time, I read this and like my jaw was on the floor. If you finished even the first Mistborn book, you have to get to this. Like you actually have to, it's a must read. Like you, you must trudge your way through the mud and get to at least book six and then read this. Number six is Mistborn, the Hero of Ages. Book talk. This is one of them ones, man. This is one of them ones. <laughs> I got that from Smitty. He's like my favorite book dogger. I started reading Sanderson with the Mistborn trilogy, right? So this was my third Sanderson book ever. And I was going to put Secret History above this. But let's just get to it, okay? The ending. The ending. It's just the best. Like, not even as a Mistborn book. Not even as a Cosmere book. Just as a book. This is, like, one of the best endings of all time. Endings like this are why, like, the term Sanderlanch was coined in the first place. Where it's just... Like, so insane. I can only think of one book that has a better ending to this, and, it, and it's coming up, so. Man, I don't want to spoil, but like, my favorite character in the Mistborn series, okay? It's been the same character since the first book. In the first book, I read that, and I was like, there's only one character that I like. It's this, it's this person, right? And then they had such an amazing, like, arc in season two. Or not even in season two. I'm even leaving that cut in, because I'm on a roll right now, right? On episode two. Or not even episode two, in book two! They had such an incredible, incredible arc, right? And then in this book, the ending. Oh my lord. They did. They. Oh my god. I Bro, when it was revealed, and then, and then, like, everybody, you know, and then they did the thing when they put the thing, and like. Oh! One of the greatest moments ever. Maybe even the best Sanderson character ever, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah, actually, probably my favorite Sanderson character ever. This peak fiction like that's it it's just peak fiction this wasn't even perfect like there was stuff that i didn't like but honestly i'm not even gonna bring it up i don't even care i, I don't even care man number five is the arithmetist i was actually planning to leave this one to the towards the end of my sanderson reading journey because i thought this was going to be a story about like a math professor or something i'm actually fraudulent this is easily the best 
like non Cosmere Sanderson book. What this really is is like Harry Potter meets Pokemon, but with chalk drawings. Okay, so like there's a school for wizards, right? But then these wizards, like they have they have a chalk. They're like chalk wizards, right? So they draw like monsters and, and animals and stuff like that, and then they fight. But then they can also defend their, themselves by like drawing lines on the ground. So this, this this fight happens like on the ground with like these 2D drawings. I will be doing this description a disservice. I already know, but like. This is, it's so sick. I, I can't even tell you like how cool of a concept this is. I came for copper and I found gold. This is like peak Sanderson writing actually in this, like, I don't, I, is this YA? I don't even, like there's levels to this. Like the depth in, the, in this mag magic system where since they're chalk drawings, right? Some kids can draw really well. And so they make these very intricate, large monsters, right? But then it takes them more time to draw that well. So then there's like drawbacks where other students can like attack them. And then there's this whole other system of like drawing defensive arrays to defend yourself, right? And then these defensive arrays are like numerical and they're made out of like basic shapes. It's so crazy and yet really easy to understand if you actually like, like read the book. I was 36 Sanderson books deep when I read this. I already knew top five for sure. Like, like, like not like trust it was top five, like, this is truly a top five Sanderson book. It actually maddens me how like how underrated this book is because the fight scene in this book, the fight scene is better than the one in Words for Radiance. I'm sorry, like Joel may be bland as a protagonist, but like what he goes through and and what happens on his in, like in his journey is just unexplainable through words. It it was engaging start to finish in a way that I I just can't convey to you. But, like don't even get me started on the other characters, but like I've read this entire thing in one day. Easy, easy. My eyes have been open to all the people who have been asking for a Rhythmata sequel all these years and have still never gotten one, okay? Because, man, like, a wise man who was facing down a shard of Adelnasium once said that you may not have my pain, but I feel yours, okay? Like, that is so tragic. Number four is The Gathering Storm. Pedro Nile on the Joe Rogan podcast would go so crazy. I really did not want to like this book, okay? When I finished the first 11 Wheel of Time books, I was so used to Robert Jordan's writing that when I got to Sanderson's, like I, I basically forgot his like how his writing style felt, right? And I was like, wait, the series is gonna be so different with Brandon's prose. Like, is, is he really gonna do the series justice? And then I read, after reading those 11 Robert Jordan books, I read the 12th Wheel of Time book by Brandon Sanderson. And it was the best one by a large, large margin. Before this, my favorite was book six, Lord of Chaos. Not comparable at all. So first thing, I'm gonna be honest. After thinking about it a lot, Robert Jordan's prose is not for me. It it, it does not. Um, it's very quirky and whimsical and magical. But with books, I realize that I just want things told to me like straight up, which it is basically how Brandon writes his books, right? Like there will be a flag in the wind, right? And Robert Jordan will be like, oh, such tap, such crimson tapestry with dragon. And then Brandon will just be like, yeah, that's a red flag. Especially with something as convoluted as the Wheel of Time, I, I just need, for the sake of my own comprehension, I need I need the style of writing, okay? Where I want a coat and a hat to be described to me as a coat and a hat. As I began reading this book, I realized something that I, I didn't realize with other Robert Jordan books. And it's that I could actually understand what was going on, okay? I'm not reading like Nynaeve touching her braid like three million times in a row. I'm not talk I'm not reading about like Matt's coat and the other thing, too, is that this is a Wheel of Time book with a Sanderlanch. Like, that's actually cheating. You know, I've read a good amount of Sanderlanches that I didn't like, but this is like peak Mistborn, peak Stormlight levels of Sanderlanch. This, this is a one of the best Sanderlanches, which is just absurd. Like, it's just so baffling to me because my favorite character doesn't really appear that much in this book. And a lot of the characters that were my favorite kind of took a backseat to other characters that I, I originally didn't like, but all the characters that were the main focus of this book, Sanderson just wrote them to such a high degree that I, 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 I've been like defeated, okay? He just wrote their arcs so well that I just had to begrudgingly accept that this is one of the best things I've ever read. Even though it was so hard to get through the first 11 books, it was so worth it just, just to get to this one. As Rand Althor likes to say, and as a very close friend of mine likes to say, madness. Madness. I have thought so hard about whether to put this two or three, but number three is Oathbringer. The impact that this book has for me is is life changing. Like genuinely, when I think of Sanderson, I think of Oathbringer. Like you, you, you guys just don't understand. Like in my own, in in my personal life, in times of strife, I be quoting th this book. When friends ask me for advice, I quote Oathbringer. Oathbringer is the third book 
in the Stormlight Archives, Brandon Sanderson's large epic fantasy series. And this is the best Stormlight Archive by leaps and bounds, in my opinion. You know, as I said, I'm a big Tudor Ramble fan. And uh, when, when both of the hosts of that podcast, Austin and Richard, said that this was their favorite Stormlight book, I was like, yep, I'm just correct. I can't believe people can dislike this book. Actually, I, I, actually I can, because um, Jack Septicai didn't like this book. And um, he's valid. I mean, like, like, honestly, the book does drag. And look, I see this book in a better light the more time goes on. And when I read this, I didn't like it nearly as much as I do now. But now I'm gonna start glazing because this is basically perfect, right? So everything clicked for me, okay? It's the strongest beginning to middle section of any Stormlight book. It's the best ending of any Stormlight book. It is the best ending that Sanderson has written ever, period. The best Sander Lanch. Genuinely, in my life, this is the closest a book has gotten to perfection for me. Stormlight as a series is so much more than the sum of its parts, okay? And the ending of this made me so emotional. It was just so insane to a point where I wish I could convey it to you just how unbelievable this, this thing was. Every character had a perfect arc. Actually, you know what? Maybe maybe Shallan didn't. Maybe I didn't like Shallan's arc as much as I did her arc in the first book. But amongst all the four books that are out right now, every character had their best arc. Every theme, every philosophy, every every risk that was taken in this book, everything landed. Everything. And the quotes were quoting, okay? You know, I mentioned Smitty on TikTok. He said that the, the Way of Kings was basically a philosophy book, right? This, this is like a philosophy book on, on like the highest degree of steroids, right? This book actually changed me. Like, I, I'm not the same person who I was when I started reading this book, in the middle of this book, and when I finished this book, and now. Like, those are like four different versions of me. Of course, no spoilers, right? But like, the hypocrite quote. I quote that so many times, dude. The, the, uh, the pain quote. The, the, you know, the next step quote. So many times. Last thing, right? This is Dalinar's book. Did not care about that man at all before this book, right? And to, the, and to some degree, I still don't care about him, right? But... I owe that fictional man an apology of the highest order, okay? I, w I was not familiar with your game, sir. I am sorry. Number two is Elantris. Didn't actually think I'd say that because I was so sure that this would be my number one. I have, like, I, I have so much love for this book. You don't, you guys don't even understand. And look, straight up, I probably like Oathbringer a lot now, right? Oathbringer is one of those stories that just just gets better and better the more time goes on. But I also like Elantris and Oathbringer in two completely different ways. While Oathbringer is this deep philosophical book, this is just incredible story. Like it's just action-packed story and I just really love the plot. Both the plot and the characters. I am a character like centric reader more than anything else, right? And more than any other Sanderson book, this was the page turner, okay? Like, I was feral, okay? I, I was turning into one of those furries from Starsight. I just needed to know what happened, okay? So, look, I, I told you guys, I like unpolished scuff stories. This is one of them. You know, this was his very first published book. He's improved a lot as an author, th author from this book. I haven't even said the plot yet, and honestly, I don't even really want to because I don't want to spoil anything about this book to anybody. But uh, this is one of the two Sanderson stories that are about the City of the Gods, right? One is Warbreaker, one is this book. I think this book kills Warbreaker. It tosses that book into like Dragon Mount. I don't know. But real quick, right? There was the City of the Gods, advanced magic, advanced technology, and one day it just all disappeared. The whole city turned grimy, the magic failed, and the gods basically became monsters, if, if you if you will. Now that I think about it, it's kind of a zombie book, kind of. This book was such a page turner because of the city's fall, right? You, throughout this book, you're just wondering, like, why did why did the city fall? I don't understand. Like, why did these gods become monsters? I, I'm just like wondering why. I have to know. Like my thirst for knowledge was way higher than Rowden's in this book, okay? Because I just really wanted to know what happened. Which brings me to the three POVs of this book. Like many Sanderson Cosmere books, there are alternating POVs. So every chapter is a different character's perspective, right? There's Rowden, there's Serene, and there's Hraithen. Serene is awesome, but she's also the weakest perspective in this book. She is this princess who comes to Elantris, the city of the gods, for love because she's been sending letters back and forth with this prince. And so she was basically e-dating, but in medieval times. But Rowden and Enfrathen, man. Rowden is the goat. He is like, actually, like he is like, dude, I, I started reading The Way of Kings and I was like, wait, Kaladin, you're just worse Rowden. He is just the classic like protagonist 
of this natural leader who will just never give up, right? I, I love that sort of character. And Hrathen is like almost the complete opposite. He's just this really complex character, very mysterious. Even as you're reading his perspective through his eyes, in his mind, you kind of don't know like what's going on with him. And that also adds to the mystery of, of what, what he's going to do. After I read this, there was no going back for me, right? Like, I know this is his first published book, right? I know there are, like, probably objectively a lot better books than this, right? This is, like, nobody's favorite book. But still, incredible. I, I just think this book is, is so awesome. Like, to this day, I'm done all Sanderson books. I have no more Sanderson books left to read. And yet, I'm still reading other books because of this book. Like, this, this book got me back into reading, too. So before we go on to the last book, right? You may be wondering... Well, Sanderson's known for his frequent release of books, right? Like, he has so many. Just look at this video. And um, he has a lot of books incoming, right? Two Months, Stormlight 5, Blightfall next year, Skyward sequel, uh, White Sand Prose version. He's In January, he's going to start Mistborn, Era 3, Ghostbloods. Uh, he just released... Or he just um, released an update on his channel that he finished a new short story, which is going to come out later next year. But while I was making this video he released another book. It is called The Most Boring Book Ever, and it is a children's picture book. And it is made in collaboration with Mr. Kibuishi here, who is the author and illustrator of Amulet. So this is crazy. Um, in terms of the story, I mean, as it, it is boring. So, you know, I mean, I'm just not going to include it in this video because, I mean, like, read the title. It's, it's, this book is so boring. Like, a kid just, like, sits in a chair and then gets up and he sits in the chair. Like, I basically spoiled the entire book. Number one, Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. Of course my favorite's the anime one. Best book of all time. What else is there to say? It's this is literally the best book I have ever read. While Elantris was this action-packed story with insane plot, and Oathbringer was this deep philosophical book which was near perfection, this is well beyond perfection. Like, this book, it, it seems like it was written for me. I read this and I was like, yo Brandon, this is like targeted. Yumi and the Nightmare Painter is the third out of the four secret project books that Brandon wrote during COVID and he released on Kickstarter to be, you know, to get the number one Kickstarter position of all time, raising over like $40 million. Now he has the number three slot. Incredible book. Insane book. Book. And it is a romance A romance fantasy between a boy and a girl from two very different societies who work very normal jobs to them, but very crazy jobs to us. And they are forced to work each other's jobs in a way that is... Well, they have to learn about each other's circumstances and civilizations. And what I mean by that is that this is a body switching story. If you can't tell from the title Yumi and the Nightmare Painter and the cover art, this is a very Asian inspired story. I know Brandon spent like two years of his life in Korea and you may be wondering like, hmm, Asian inspired story, body switching. Yes, this book has three inspirations, okay? One, very obvious. When I was reading this, I was like, wait, this is basically your name by Makoto Shinkai, right? So the body switching was, was, was from Makoto Shinkai. The second one was Final Fantasy X, which unfortunately I have never played, but I, I do want to play it now because of this book. And the third influence is Hikaru no Go. Out of all things, I can't believe Sanderson has read Hikaru no Go. I read that when I was in like, like elementary school, high school. If you guys don't know, Hikaru no Go is a manga and an anime about a boy who meets a ghost who is basically the ghost of Magnus Carlsen. But instead of chess, it's like the Japanese version called Shogi. And so since this boy named Hikaru is the only person who can see Magnus Carlsen's ghost, he just enrolls in a lot of these Shogi tournaments and the, the ghost just tells him what to do, like um, like Stockfish. So I love Hikaru no Go, first of all, right? But this is relevant because the boy works a 9 to 5 where he paints pictures to deal with monsters. So he's basically like a cop, right? So the girl like stacks stones for a living and builds like inukshuks to deal with spirits. So she's basically a shrine maiden. And so when these two body swap, it's exactly like Hikaru no Go, where one of them is a ghost and one of them like a, in a physical body, in the other person's body. And the ghost has to advise the other person on how to live their life. And I recognize that I'm super biased, okay? Like I have watched nearly 500 anime at this point, read a ton of manhwa, manga, right? But this is my list, so honestly don't hate the player hate Moash. But yeah, no, for once, jokes aside, beautiful beautiful story this story just resonates with me like so deeply and it's, it's a shame because even though this is a standalone you actually should read like the 11 books before this i would have loved this book whenever i got around to reading it but i think i just read it at like the perfect perfect time in my life and i think this is like the perfect book for me i actually sobbed reading the ending of this book which is unbelievable work and the worst part is usually when i cry to like any sort of 
like piece of fiction it's usually because like i can relate to it right and i think like back on my own life but no i just cried because the plot development was so powerful the story was just written so good that that like the plot point the like the plot point was just so strong that i just had to cry it wasn't even relatable despicable sardonic beautiful work there was no doubt in my mind that this would be number one once i read it i was still like like to the very last second debating on on two and three but this undisputedly the best brandon sanderson book in my opinion like like genuinely if you if you have a problem with this book i don't even care like you're a hater this is the best thing i've ever read goodbye